All right, welcome back to another episode of the Christian Sages. Woo! Woo! Yeah! Woo! We don't have an applause track. This is our, it's our little applause track right there. It's the crowds. Yeah, there's so many crowds. We're actually recording this at Living Word Church, which is where Jonathan Dutcher and I attend. Jonathan is going to be guest hosting today, as well as being interviewed. We are. He'll probably see some more of him coming up, and we will. He'll probably guest host quite a bit. Uh, we're going to be doing a new series called Generations, where we're going to be talking, interviewing different generations of ministry, uh, whether it be kind of like the millennials, my generation, Generation X, the older generation, which is my father's generation, uh, the generation before that are probably all dead, so that would require some witchcraft. Rip. And yeah, <laughs> we're not going to. Well, maybe we will. We're discussing paranormal, which we ha- we will be discussing the paranormal. We're summon. Yeah, maybe I will summon like my grandfather and ask sure. him what he thinks of the, what is it, the state witch of the of church. The witch of Endor? Is that oh, yeah, the witch of Endor. <laughs> when, uh, Which sounds uh, like something yeah. straight out of Lord of the Rings. It really <laughs> does. Or Star Wars. The witch of Endor. It was yeah. actually a planet Endor. So that's oh, where the Ewok oh, Perfect. Were. So she was an Ewok witch. Mm. Yeah, okay. he summoned her. He summoned, what, the soul of Samuel? Yes. To talk to him. He's like, isn't there a prophet? And why are you going to this witch? Right. Isn't there a prophet in Israel? Yeah. Right. So. So we'll be uh, we'll be discussing different things. Um, this is actually take two because the first time we did this, the sound didn't work. So mm-hmm. we've had two episodes in a row where there's no sound, which is kind of why we haven't had any episodes out in a while. We're uh, trying to figure out what our technical issues are. I think we got it down here, uh, but at home I got to kind of figure out what was going on at my house and why it didn't record Doug last time. You heard me, but you didn't hear Doug. So it sounded like a really good conversation with myself, right? Which very interesting as it may be, probably is not what you want to hear. I was going to say it probably worked, though. It probably <laughs> it did. It did. <laughs> it did. I mean, technically, when I'm recording, and I'm just sitting there talking out loud anyway. So right. it does kind of look right. like. And Doug's just really like, mm-hmm. yeah, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. Uh-huh. yeah. Although he's learned to talk over me. Oh, okay, gotcha. He's, he's, he's known me for a long time. So he can uh, just hold us up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. We have with us Jonathan Dutcher. He is the praise and worship leader. And are you now the youth kind of youth pastors? Yeah, youth technically leaders, youth leaders, head, head youth leaders. Head youth I don't leaders. think you get to be a pastor unless you <coughs> you kill do a, calf a wedding or something. I don't oh, know. you got to do a wedding or something, or right? Like two weddings. You got to do funeral. two weddings and a funeral. That's yeah. a Tyler Perry movie right there. It is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to. Movie. That's how it works. You have to do two to three ceremonies illegally. Gotcha. And then at that point. You send it up to the board, and they they review it. the The Klingon right. Church, the Klingon you, Church, yeah, they ordain yeah. you from there. So, yeah. yeah, haven't quite gotten, haven't quite punched my ticket yet. Gotcha. You know I mean? So, gotcha. gotcha. Yep. There's no like in the non denominational church. There's no like real uh, age requirement necessarily. Right. Or, Basically, they're like, "You're a pastor." Yeah. Or like, yeah. "No, you're not going to be a pastor. Yeah, <laughs> We're ordaining you, but maybe not." Right. It depends. Right. It's kind of like. Mm-hmm. I, it's kind of interesting how that works, though, because when you go on a different tangent here, which I guess, too, is kind of like this generation. We'll jump right into it. This generation is kind of going back more to the view of a board and the view of organizational accountability as opposed to relational accountability, which my dad's generation had come out of that. And they founded all these non denominational churches, and it became about uh, relational accountability. Sure. So it was kind of like well, I'm a pastor and I started a church, so mm-hmm. I find another pastor who decides to ordain me. Sure. And then I'm now ordained. There's no real organization. Or you created an organization. Sure. Like, like I got some yeah. friends that do this. Yes, exactly. It's like, yeah. I'm just going to keep it between me and my friends. It's like, <laughs> it's like I got online ordained. Right. You know, at the Church of Satan. <laughs> sure. It's like I used to be a QB for this this football team, so me and all my QB friends are going to start a league. Yes, right. That's how it's exactly. going to happen. We're not going to yes. have a – we're going to report to each other. That's right. That's just the way it's going to be. There's accountability to each other, so sure. we decide who wins the Super Bowl. Sure. In our Super Bowl. Right. I mean, because honestly, Roger Goodell is, is Satan himself anyway, so. Yeah. 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 So yeah. you don't need anybody like that. Mm-hmm. No. But it's true. You don't need the And I think that this generation, um, a lot of churches are primarily run as a business. And to a certain extent, you do need it. You do yeah. need it. You need business structure in a sense. I mean, if you think about it, it's money coming in, money going out, how, and how do you organize it? How do you? Everybody has to make sure that they know what their job responsibility is. Everybody has to make sure that money's being handled properly, sure. and that 
all the tasks that you're doing on a a Sunday basis or yeah. a, a weekly basis are being carried out the way that you want them to be. Yeah. And and it's it is the same as a business because you have a goal and you want to be effective at that goal. Yeah. So it's basically the local church is is like a little micro business in a sense. It is. It is. It is, but that's not the way con- that was kind of again if you're talking about the older generation that created the non-denominational mm-hmm. movement. Right. It was a very uh, like organic It was, yeah. naturally created just like you, we just need to get together, idea right. idea that it was a business. It's not a business. It's right. a church. Right. So we're not going to run it like a business. Sure. But there were a lot of issues that people ran into because of that lack of accountability with mm-hmm. finances or with relational issues or whatever it may be and there wasn't that accountability so you lost a lot of people or got a bad name to some degree because of people that abused that system if you would because the idea of accountability through relationship i love that idea uh, because you don't have the constraints and all the politics that come from an organizational accountability but you do also have the downfall of not having accountability on that level so it's just kind of like i'm accountable to you you're accountable to me who's really in charge. Like, I can really kind of do whatever I want. What happens when the, you know, when the congregation has a problem with the pastor, he goes off the deep end. Mm-hmm. Do I just, really, the only recourse she had was just to leave the church. Right. Because there was really nobody you could go to and say, hey, you know, yeah, you could go to my dad's pastor, but what really could he have done? Right. It's not like he could fire him. Right. I mean, and even if he did, he's like, okay, you know, yeah. you're fired. It's yeah. like, I'm exactly. not leaving. <laughs> it's like you, my church. Yeah, right. I created this church. Where are you? you know, get sure. out of here. You know. Sure. So without that ability, I guess when you kind of look at it, now, and I am grew up in the, the non-denominational movement, and I definitely lean more towards that accountability structure of relational accountability to organizational sure. accountability. But why is it that this generation has kind of gone back to this idea of, of uh, organizational accountability? Well, I think the more that I've thought about it, um, the differences between each generation. I think that every generation finds God through their own system, in a sense. You know what I mean? So <clears throat> the reason that my parents' generation um, kind of started this, like, very, like I said, it was a very um, organic and kind of like, you know, we love Jesus. Well, I guess it was probably the generation before them was, like, the hippie movement yeah. and the Jesus yeah. movement. Um, Which my parents came out of. Sure. So it was a very like, you know, let's just get together and talk about the Bible. We'll meet in homes. And then it's like, all right, this isn't, you know, we need to legitimize ourselves a little bit. So we're going to start meeting in buildings and we're going to have legitimate services. Right. And so for them, it was what they they wanted to distance themselves from where they came from. And I think it's the same thing with this generation in a lot of categories that want to distance themselves from where we came from, because that wasn't our experience. Sure. That was my parents' experience. That was my grandparents' experience. Right. Every generation is is moving to have their own experience with God, and so they re- relate to him in a certain way. Yeah. And that structure looks different because it's a different group of people. Yeah. So I think that's one of the biggest differences, and, and I do think that we didn't – I didn't experience growing up in a denominational church or in a – Sure. Church that maybe there wasn't a lot of quote unquote life, or it was just strictly business. You went into the church, you you did your thing, you sat in your pew. It was and religious, then, right? It was very yeah. religious. So then my parents came out of that yeah. and found something new, sure. and were so excited about it. But then I grew up in that, so that became familiar to me. And eventually, what becomes familiar to you, you either take it for granted, or it's just time to change. It's just time to do I think something it becomes, different. It becomes religious. You're just right. It, it right. It becomes it right. Form, which is what our father's generation right. was Fought tired against. of. Yeah, it, they're like, we don't want it. My right. dad even had a song where he said, you know, let's quit doing anything we've done for 50 years. Well, I don't necessarily agree with that. And and to apply that logic, well, then, Dad, you we're going to stop doing what you did. You know exactly. So it's yeah. because you know they'd be like, well, it hasn't been 50 years, but still, sure. it's if you go with that logic, then pretty much you're just throwing out all the wisdom. Of everybody that ever came before you, because sure. you think you know better. Sure. So not, and, and again, I'm not disagreeing with my father's generation. I think there are certain things that that they do and did that need to need to be Stay. sustained. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, and there are certain ways that they've done things that work, but then you see culturally, there are certain things that don't work anymore. Mm-hmm. So, from <clears throat> yeah. your perspective as a millennial, mm-hmm. 
Why is that? You know, what is it that, what are those, what are some of those things that don't work? We'll get mm-hmm. into more later, but what are yeah. some of the things that don't work and why do you think they don't work in this generation uh-huh. as opposed to the generation, your dad's generation? Well, I think, first of all, technology changes a lot, right? Mm-hmm. So, for example, you and me, even though we're not from the same generation, you would be like upset if somebody came to your door, was knocking at your door, wanting to share the gospel with you, right? Yeah, I never liked that to begin okay. with. Okay, nobody let. I mean, I mean, and back in the day, that was evangelism. Like you'd go door yeah. to door, or oh, you'd yeah. go walk. I've done out. it, Hate right? It. And evangelism it. was also. I mean, this church did it for a little bit. You you would go to the mall, you'd walk around, you'd see if you could pray for anybody, and it yeah, really, no it's tracks. right, and it sounds great, yeah. but it's like think of yourself on the other the other end of that where you're walking through the mall, you're going shopping, and these people walk up to you, these strangers, and start to talk to you about the gospel, you're right. like, it's not like, oh, man, I really don't want to hear this necessarily. It's just like, you know, I'm kind of here to do a job and then get back and get yeah. home. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's not. You're invading my, my Sure. Space people here. are social these days. But yeah. If you think about it, kids from this generation, from my generation, we've been playing online games forever. You have been. So on a daily basis, they're probably talking to more people than maybe your generation did. But it's not face to face. But it's not face to face. And everything is so going, superficial. Right. Well, so it's not, you're not going out. You're not going into public places. So I think for this generation, there's like the super social that go out and go to clubs and go to bars and stuff. But there's so much online. There's so much with social media. He's the, he's, there's the, there's the coffee chair. <laughs> there it is. There it is. And it has to happen at some episode. Yep. <laughs> I'm not even drinking coffee. I feel like I have to choke. I don't. <laughs> oh, Doug's laughing in his house right now. Uh, that Making was for you, Doug. Yeah, one that, was for you. That yeah. one was for you. So <coughs> social media has played a really big part in that. It's played a, a huge role in how we relate to one another, I think. People my age, and I should say I'm I, really the only qualifications that I have to talk is I'm 25 years old and I grew up in the church. That's pretty much it, but I'm sure. not an expert at anything. Um, no, but that, that makes you an expert on this generational view of church because <laughs> sure. you did grow up in this and you and yeah. you are involved in ministry so it's not yeah. like you're just you just got saved or <clears throat> right. you've been saved your whole life and backslid and came back or sure you just simply didn't go to church really that much anyway mm-hmm. you know you were you're somebody who's been involved in this in some way shape or form your whole life so on some level it makes you an expert to some degree on I this guess. generational view of things to sure. some degree sure because i've been in i mean i've yeah. at least been on one side my whole life and I've dealt with what that's like what it was like going through a transition of generations I've experienced that and I've had to ask myself a lot of questions and you find yourself fighting because you love your parents and you love I I, I love the church that I grew up in and at the same time I love where our church is headed and I love where we're at right now and I don't think that there's any reason to be sad about it but I do think that sometimes it felt like you had to pick sides. Yeah. Like sure. it's like either I agree with my dad or either I agree with right, or where I, we're headed. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I have to be. Right. Yeah. I mean, I wrestle with that too, being in between both. Sure. My dad having given the church over to my brother and my brother being the current pastor. And I'm in between, sure. like I'm between both these, uh, to like Gandalf said when uh, he brought Pippin in to talk to. Uh, Denethor, you, mm-hmm. sorry that you had to be between such terrible old men. That's the way I feel. <laughs> <laughs> Not that they're old, but that's sure. the way I feel sometimes, like torn between this, you know, okay, they're both, when, you know, when they were having more of issues talking with it, talking things out, you feel trapped in between two different mm-hmm. perspectives. Like, but I want to, I want to back up what my brother's doing and where the division of where the church is going, but there are certain things that I agree with my dad on. That and how do you broach that? How do you approach that? How do you, how do you work those things out? You know, in your own walk. You know. Yeah. So and that can be hard for mm-hmm. <coughs> that this generation as well. You know. Yeah. Well, I think that we, we. I feel like my dad. Here's the thing. It's like he doesn't believe anything. I don't think anything fundamentally different from what we believe or no. f- from what's preached. No. Um, I think that there is a. Um, it's like you, you don't want, and I could totally understand from a dad's perspective, I don't want everything that I've taught my kids to be either undermined or to change yeah. or to, yeah. and maybe I shouldn't say to change because if, uh, and, and here's where like I'm getting in my own head because I'm thinking he's listening and I'm right. trying to have this conversation with him, but um, you see things change and it, it worries you that maybe what I taught them wasn't, maybe I didn't teach them well enough the reason why 
behind why we did what we did. And so when these new sure. things come up that are a lot of gray area of like, yeah. I don't know, is yeah, that yeah. allowed in the church? I mean, coffee. <laughs> ten, 15 oh, yeah. years ago, coffee in the church was like, oh, you're secret friendly. Like you, right, you can't you know you I mean? have a coffee bar? You, right. You, you you're like, I mean. Have coffee. Well, even, even 50 years ago. Well, wow, you're wearing you're wearing jeans. Oh my gosh! Yeah. You know you're not wearing dress shoes. You're not wearing sure, a suit and tie. Sure. You know, and even that was hard for my dad's generation. And you, I mean, you still wear a suit a lot yeah. of times in church. But it's there was a reason behind it. Sure, then. there was a reason that they did it. For us now, it's totally different. And I, I know I've had a discussion with my parents about wearing hats in church, and um, they they don't agree. They don't like that we do that. That you can that you wear a hat in church, especially if you. Lead praise and worship with a hat on. Or if you're the pastor. Or if you're the pastor. But <laughs> if the pastor does it, why am I getting in trouble for it? Anyway, um, I do say, though, if somebody were to walk in, that here's here's the reason, though. It's if not so- like you're wearing a hat that has swear words on it. Right? No, no. It's just, you know, it's a sign of respect if you take your hat Ozzy off. Ozzy Osbourne the, biting the hat off of a bat. Right. The, the head off bat. of a bat. Yeah. yeah. Does that hat exist? I'm sure it does. Oh, God. Yeah, I'm sure I'm it does. Sure. So if you saw someone, though, who was a non-believer walk into the church and they had a hat on, would you stop them immediately? No, of course say, not. Would you stop them ever? No, I wouldn't. Right? No, I. I think I it's this either. idea that there's a certain change, and there is a level of respect that sure. comes with a certain level of dress. Sure. And for them, when you're coming into the church, then you should be showing God the level of respect, your highest level of respect. Mm-hmm. Well, the highest level of respect would be to dress up in your son, what we call our Sunday best. Sure. Because that was the idea. It's your Sunday best. You dress the best you can on Sunday morning. It doesn't matter if, if that was whatever that looked like for you, mm-hmm. you did your best. If you couldn't afford a suit, you wore whatever it was, but you weren't going to come in casual. Sure. Because it was a level of respect. Right. But that changes culturally. And this culture, yeah. people don't go to work dressed like in suits and ties as often sure. as they used people to. People don't even go to weddings in no, dress shirts. Exactly. People don't bands. have weddings right. wearing tuxedos. Like right. Some do, but it, it's just a completely different view. And I think there are certain things that are cultural. So what does culturally, what does it look like to be respectful for your generation? Right. Wearing a hat is not considered disrespectful. Sure. For their generation, wearing a hat in church was. So being able to balance that difference because to them you're just being disrespectful right but according to your culture you're not but according to theirs it is and that's where i think mm-hmm. sometimes we bre- we have a hard time breaching this where th- we're fighting over stuff that really we shouldn't be fighting over in my opinion like yeah. why am i fighting over whether he's wearing a hat or not or whether his jeans are ripped or whether he's wearing jeans Right. You know, he's wearing jeans and a T-shirt as opposed to wearing a suit and tie. What does it matter? Well, because suit and ties are your – you should dress your best. Well, culturally, people wear T-shirts and blazers sure. and, sure. Sh- you know, uh, sneakers now. Right. And that's considered, you know, coming to work dressed, you know, very, very professional. Right. Well, and I also think there's – um, a case to be made to say why is it that on Sunday we do our best to look our best and act our best and be our best but then we don't care how we live the rest of the week so and that's so kind of your perspective kind of, on a little bit is, yeah so and it's I like you know that. what God loves you exactly where you are and he loves you throughout the week when you're dressed like a slob or when you're when you're not always presentable and I think that's the heart behind it and I think that we can but here's the other and I, and I don't mean to change the subject no, too hey, soon but good um, we can say well, God sees your heart and he knows your heart. And uh, honestly, we can hope that that's, we try our best. We do our best. We do what we can to please God. We should be having our own time with him yeah. where we yeah. pray, we read the word and we ask God, God, what do you, what direction do you want my life to go in? Sure. Is there something that you want me to change? Is there something that I'm not doing right? Is there something? And that's between, and I don't think, I think if you give God the opportunity to look at your heart and say, God, search my heart and tell me yeah. if there's anything that needs to change that there will at least be something that will be brought to your mind, right? Right. And if there isn't and you're trying and you're doing your best, then I guess whose place is it to come up to you and, and tell you, right. you know, well, X, Y, Z, blah, 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 blah. I think blah. that was another one. That dis- Nobody said you couldn't come to church. Yeah. It was more of if you're in form of leadership. Or sure. if, you're in a, if you're the pastor, if you're in a, sure. you know, once you've reached a certain level where you are past that baby stage, sure. then there should be an actual physical change. Yeah. You should start respecting it at a certain mm-hmm. level. So to them, this view of, it's it, like you guys might see, they would probably see that as seeker friendly. <clears throat> like, right. why are you doing that? Well, because you don't want people in the church to feel uncomfortable. 
Well, they didn't want people to feel uncomfortable either. They didn't say they had to dress up or whatever unless you reach a certain level of ministry. To them, making it, well, you know, because I've heard this said, well, I don't want the people to feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So I dress comfortably so they don't feel uncomfortable. Well, that's to my parents' generation, that would be right. considered you're watering it down, you know, you're being seeker-friendly. Mm -hmm. uh, my generation, the Gen X, would say, who cares? Right. <laughs> Like I don't know why we're fighting over this. Kind of. Sure. That's my. Let's generation. focus on God. Let's not yeah, focus on. It's like why? Because right. honestly, whether you dress up or don't dress up, how is that seeker friendly? If you're if you're bogging down the word, sure. Then right. you're becoming seeker friendly. If you're not gonna, willing to talk about certain things or flow in the gifts of the spirit, which we will talk about next, mm -hmm. or allow the gifts of the spirit to flow because you're afraid it makes people uncomfortable. Now, in my opinion, you're then becoming seeker friendly. Yeah. And you're not presenting the gospel the way it should be. And, and you know, I, I don't believe that's the right way to do church. Mm -hmm. And my parents would agree with that. But I've heard your generational people say, well, why, you know, a lot of it has to do with your view on, and which I do kind of want to segue into. <coughs> the view of the gifts of the Spirit, prophecy, speaking in tongues, sure. laying out of hands, having people. Like, I mean, obviously, at Living Word, we do at the end, mm -hmm. come on up, and if you need prayer, we'll pray for you. Mm -hmm. Which is great. Like we, but but honestly, since I've been back, hardly I've never heard one prophecy. There's very little speaking in tongues or even talking about flowing in the gifts of the spirit at all. There's no words of wisdom, words of knowledge, at least not in a corporate sense. I don't yeah, know what's sure. going on sure. when you're praying for people or whatever. But sure. that used to go on. So the general, what I've heard from your generation is, well, we don't do that anymore because we just don't feel like it belongs on a Sunday morning. Not that we don't believe in it, sure. but that we don't necessarily believe it, or it was taken to too much of an extreme. Sure. And the older generations where they just allowed too much in the church became almost chaotic, right. and services lasted three or four hours because everybody had to prophesy and everybody had to right. do something. But yet, everybody then you had to have... be slain in the spirit. Right, yeah, and exactly. had to come up and throw the little, over the women's skirts, yes, exactly. had to throw the little well, blankets. Well, that's another thing. Like, there, none of that. I don't, right. you just, not I'm talking about this church alone, but any church. Like, you just don't see it as much. Not, it, maybe down south and some of the... Mm -hmm. Southern Pentecostal, they're still going, and they're still every you know Sunday morning slain. People are getting slain out in the spirit. Mm -hmm. So I want to hear your perspective on that because I've heard sure. some interesting perspectives. Like uh, I've heard that our view of speaking in tongues, for instance, is a little off. Like like certain people I've talked to, and I'll talk to my brother when he's on here about this. Sure. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but certain people I've heard say, "Well, they don't believe speaking in tongues is really speaking another language, but literally speaking in a language you don't know." Like mm -hmm. You're speaking in Chinese because a Chinese, you have to speak to a Chinese person. Right. And that's actually what speaking in tongues in the context mm -hmm. of the Bible really is. It's not that speaking another language the way we were taught. Sure. Uh, that prophecy, which I actually kind of agree with, majority of prophecy from the 90s and 80s and was ed edification, not really actually prophecy, but we mm -hmm. called it prophecy. And genuine prophecy there's, doesn't happen every Sunday morning. So I agree with that, too. Uh, but I want to hear your perspective as, sure. a, as a millennial. Well, I think first take, when we did this, the first take, I said yes. something that I've been thinking about. So sure. it seemed like when... Jonathan, take two. Take two. When we had this transition in our church, um, that there was... I've heard it described like this by a good friend of ours, Josh, Josh Racine. Yeah. He said, he goes, it's like a pendulum. He goes, it seems like it was swinging to a very spiritual supernatural. And that's kind of like where it was hanging. Right. Um, with the last generation, um, like late 90s, you had the renewal and everything, and it was just everything was crazy. It yeah. was crazy, but it was it was a good time for them, and that was – I mean, I was only – I was like three or four when right. that happened. So, you been so and then – I was in Bible school. Right, and then the latest wave ever since maybe like mid-2000s and everything has been very – trying to make the word practical and trying to break it down so that people can understand it and apply it in their daily lives, and it kind of took out the spiritual – a lot of the – spiritual aspect of um maybe the manifestation of the gifts of the spirit right um but it didn't i don't think ever in this church it ever took away the truth no I, I don't think it was ever i don't believe in away. most churches it took yeah. away the truth it's not that and it wasn't meant to right. take away the power of god in any way but it was just different it was like a just a shift so i think we're going to try to get back to the middle and i think that's what we agreed upon at the end of our last conversation was really you need to have both both things oh i agree and so what we said, though, was you can't be so spiritual that you can't relate to anybody or Very connect true. with anyone. Very true. But you can't be so practical that you're using it as an excuse not to try. 
Oh, I agree. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. well, if it's not practical, then then God obviously right. doesn't want me to do it. Right. Or, or, oh, I made a mistake yesterday and, you know, or I'm living sure. in sin. And it's like, you know what? God loves me. It's cool. It's fine. You know what I mean? So yeah. there's there is a balance. Yes. And there's a lot of gray area. And I think that that's where we're having a lot of these like these conflicts where we're, we're talking about the older generation being upset with the younger generation or just people being upset. I'm not always going to say it's a generational thing. It's just No, but I think people. it's perspectives. Like sure. After our conversation, one of the things I realized on Praise and Worship, which we'll talk about, mm-hmm. is the ju- the perspectives on dancing, shouting, yeah. pr- uh, praise in general. There was a different perspective. It wasn't that you disagreed with certain things. Your perspectives on it were different. And because of that, it changed the application of it. Sure. Which, to someone from my generation, didn't like the change. Sure. We're like, that doesn't make any sense to us. Why are you doing that? But we didn't understand the reasoning in your thinking. We just assumed it was because of this. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Right. And, and it wasn't necessarily. It was just you didn't quite understand why we were doing mm-hmm. what we did. And we don't we don't understand why you didn't, why you stopped doing it. Sure. This disconnect in perspective. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like it's, to hit on that point, I feel like um, when I started leading praise and worship in in youth group, I felt like I had to replicate the same thing that happened on Sunday morning. And here I am just a a punk kid. And it's like my relationship with God isn't necessarily anything deep or special or where I felt like, you know, God had really brought me out of something. and, And I really even understood how thankful I should be or sure. how to celebrate what he's done for me because yeah. I didn't even realize what he had done. You know what I mean? So I felt a pressure to manufacture the same thing that we experienced on a weekly basis Yeah, and then got to the point where I realized I, I can't manufacture this. Absolutely. I can't make something real that I don't have the connection with God to do on my own. Sure. So how do I connect with God? Not how did my dad connect with God? Because my dad led praise and worship too. Sure. So it's like, how yeah, do I lead did. like my dad led? How do I lead like pastor led? How do I lead like pastor Josh led? Um, I couldn't do what they, I, I could not do the same thing that they did and get the same results. Sure. And I think that's because I did not have the relationship with God, but I also have a different relationship with God sure. than they have. So I'm trying to relate to him and to relate to everybody here in in my own way and in a way that's real authentic and genuine right for me sure and i agree with that because yeah. everybody has to do that but sure. it kind of sidesteps the question <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> no I, that was I, thought I on my mind i was like I gotta no no it's great forget. because i wrestled yeah. with the same thing when i led praise and worship yeah. every praise and worship leader does that you have to try to duplicate what you saw yeah but you can't be that right i can't be my brother i can't be my father greatest revelation i ever came to and i was in my late 30s when i finally came to it was i don't have to be them i spent yeah. most of my life feeling insecure and bad about myself because i wasn't them and i couldn't be them and i couldn't get the response they got from people i'm never going to because i'm me yeah they can't get the response i get because they're not me sure and so coming to that realization that even my ministry ministering to people was not in mimicking but in allowing God to use the distinctiveness that made me me. But I think the question is more along the lines of <clears throat> um, where is, why is it that there is such a difference in the application, though, in general, generationally? For instance, mm. I'm a praise specialist. For me, praise is a huge part of praise and worship. Uh, in today's society, even cut it out of the name. They don't call it praise and worship anymore, it's worship. Praise is mentioned more in the Bible than worship. Why are we cutting out something that is actually close, as close or closer to God's heart than worship? Mm-hmm. But this generation, they don't like praise. At least from what I was told was we don't, we don't want to dance. We don't want to shout. It's uncomfortable for us. Uh, but praise for us looks differently. So is it a cultural thing that in the 80s and 90s, Praise was you're singing the fast songs, you're doing the Holy Ghost jig, you know, and you and you're shouting, and that was what praise was. And in this generation, praise is more quieter. The music is slowed down. People aren't shouting and dancing as much. Generally, if someone's dancing in a church, it's somebody from my generation or older. Uh, the ne- new generation isn't at all. Um, not to say that they're not singing, but you know they don't start out anymore with like our church is different we still do to some degree but a lot of churches i've been to don't start out with fast songs they go right into slow songs mm-hmm. and then they might then they'll sing a fast song and go back to a slow song to yeah. me i weird. find that weird like yeah exactly <laughs> like i don't like that but there's whole generation of people that think that's fine yeah 
Um, and I was told, well, we're praising. It just doesn't look like your praise. We don't want to dance, so what? We don't want to shout, so what? Mm -hmm. And you had made a comment in our last one, mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to take this away from you because I want you to say it, but it really sure. struck with me, was to you, you felt like it wasn't genuine. And one of the reasons why you guys had kind of, and I've heard other people in this generation say the same thing. Uh, they 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 don't do it because it doesn't feel genuine. Genuine for us, <coughs> yeah. For you, but in the yeah. same extent, my generation did it because by faith. It wasn't yeah. about whether we felt genuine. It was a principle. We do this because God desires it, and by doing so, something changes spiritually inside of us. Mm -hmm. So we will shout and we will praise God because He's worthy of it, irrespective oh, yeah. of how I feel. So we wouldn't cut that out. So cutting that out is very frustrating to my generation, to my dad's generation. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was more of a perspective idea than just a, we thought, you thought you were better than us and you just didn't want to do it. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, sure. So sure. I want you to elaborate more on that again because you're going to say it a lot better than what I just oh, said. Oh, man, I hope so. Um, <laughs> geez. Well, it's not, and it's not that I don't believe in the physical expression of praise um, <gasps> because I definitely do. I just feel like, I grew up, uh, you just dance because that's what you should do. Sure. You dance because everybody else was dancing. Right. Or you shout because that's, you know, if you want to show that you right. believe it or something that sure. you shout, then you shout. Um, and I think now a lot of people don't. Um, now, here's where I was fighting with my own battle, right? So one side of me is like, you know, I don't, I don't want to just do something and just get in the motion of, of right. just doing it because sure. I just always have done it and I want to understand why I do it and I want it to be a genuine thing coming from my heart. And I absolutely understand where you're coming from too because there are times in your life where you don't feel like glorifying God, sure. but he's still worthy no right. matter what and he's still worth it. Yeah. And so even if you are concerned about looking stupid or foolish, that's what I'm kind of trying to learn in, in myself and in my own life because I've had such a fear of, of man Sure. of what other people thought of me that it would prevent me from doing things because I was afraid that people would overanalyze it or, or make judgments about how I live my life based on stepping out in faith. So there was a right. time in my life where I remember <clears throat> I would be up front and I would feel like I needed to say something to somebody. And I thought about it this morning on the way to work. Um, there was this guy that was in our church who had kind of been like backsliding for a while. He hadn't been here in years. Right. And then all of a sudden he shows up one Sunday and I felt God was telling me, like, I need to say something to him. I need to say something. And he brought an analogy into my mind about um, about Jacob wrestling with the angel. And I got up and I told, I think it was your mom, I told Pastor Elaine, I was like, you know, I feel like God's telling me to say something about this. I don't know who it's for, but I, I think that God's telling me to say something to whatever. And uh, so I said it, right? And, I mean, think about it now. Like I do feel prompt. I do feel prompted sometimes like, you know, sure. I should say this or I should say that while I'm leading or maybe somebody needs to hear this. Yeah. But it's like, man, I don't think I would do that now. Um, and I went to him after church and he, he said, I really appreciate what you said. He goes, I just wanted to show you what I was reading in the Bible. And he showed me some scripture in Philippians and it was like word for word what I had said. Right. I was like, I feel like God's telling you you need to make a choice. Yeah. And what you're going to do now. I don't know what happened to him and I don't right. think good things happen to him. I don't know what he ended up doing with his life. Right. But it's like there in that moment, there was such a culture of like, you know, if you feel God's telling you to do something, just do it. And it's like, whatever. right. But why has that gotten lost? I don't know. I, I partially think that it is, um, people are afraid. I think is one, okay. it could be one reason. Another is that people don't, we don't under, not everybody understands. And I think that's the biggest thing. And that's why I'm totally, just I feel incompetent on all of these topics because I just don't know. I don't know enough to really have an opinion on something. Well, I want to know more your opinion. Just like why do you, you know, because they're like, again, well, getting back to praise and yeah. worship. Why do we cut? Why is it just called worship now? Why is it no longer called praise and worship? Mm -hmm. Why? You, you're literally, my generation says you're disrespecting something that is very important and feels like, your generation's like, why is it important? Like, right. Like, what are you talking about? Like, we don't mean to, we don't mean to cut it out, but yet you don't put it back either. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's yeah. like, why is it like, it's still just worship. It's always you. like, it always kind of feels like it's the awkward part. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's the fast songs are hard to come by these days too because that's a lot true. Of people are writing them uh, because <laughs> of well, yeah. I, again, I'm not talking about. Uh, it's like this whole generation just faked yeah. it out. Like even yeah. nobody's writing them. It's like you can't find them. Right. Unless you're, I think Planet Shakers is the only place I'm finding anything I really like. Right. Fast wise, it's like you, it's just completely phased out. Why? Mm-hmm. Like what? What has happened to cause that? I think that worship, though, has become such a um, sensationalized or like it's such a it's gotten so good. I feel like as far as a production level yeah. and as like a, these songs are manufactured to make you feel a certain way. That's just True. the way that it is, I'm, I'm not in a sense. Not and it's and I'm not saying that it's a bad thing because you right. need to have music that connects to people and you need to have words that people can connect with. Right. And I think that it's gotten so. um I don't know, so effective that praise wasn't brought up to that. Like it wasn't brought up to that standard. So to a lot of people, it's not as it's like worship is like the really good, like ooey gooey part. You know what I mean? That right. Everybody exactly. Likes to get into. So and I see where you're coming from. I will say f- from my I had another friend who said that I'm just suffering through praise to get to worship because mm-hmm. that's really what I want to go. Why can't I just cut it out? Now? Yeah. And I don't think that's right. I don't I don't all. agree right. with that perspective, right. but I'm seeing that more. Sure. And, but to me, it's because praise, worship requires less of you. The whole idea of praise was that it's a to sacrifice give of you, yeah. And so worship doesn't require a sacrifice, and and so, but yet, can you really enter into true worship without that sacrifice? And I think that's my dad's generation had a basic understanding of there was kind of like a structure it was to a it. formula, almost. a formula, yeah, yeah, exactly that worked, and it was entering his course Thanksgiving and gates of praise, and that was my dad's view. And to get into the holy of holies, you had to do that. So if you cut that out, you're not really entering into the holy of holies. So you just kind of wandered around the outer courts, and we're calling that the presence of God. And so for a generation, my dad's generation, even mine to some degree, we're not feeling the presence. We're like we're not feeling it. Like you're saying this is great worship, and I'm going like going nah, not really. Mm-hmm. You know, so how much of that is? Just culturally, like we're just right. being pains in the butt. You know what I'm saying? Right. We're just being like, well, we're just not going to do it because we're old and you're not doing it right. our way. You know, or is it really Bring that they're back just ancient of days? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Every tongue in heaven and earth. That's right. We want that drum solo. <laughs> you want that you sweet know. flute solo. We do. That. We do. Ron was Cole's it the band, whatever oh. it is? Yeah, <laughs> the one with the, boop, 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 the one that Dad would do the fake. Uh, What's the one Dad would do the fake? The uh, fake bag bag sound. <laughs> uh, down the mountain, down the river the flows. Down the mountain, yeah. the river flows. Yeah, right. yeah. We'll bring back the river songs. Right, that sweet bass by <laughs> I can't remember that guy's name. <laughs> but yeah, no, I, I and I and I get that. Cul- see, this is where I guess the culturally th- music styles change. Sure. So definitely. I can understand, and I think that's where I came to understanding. Culturally, things change. Culturally, music is different for you. Yeah, you don't listen to the same kind of music I listen to. So, what works for me is not going to inspire you. Let me ask you a question, though. When yeah. you say praise, is it is praise a tempo? Is praise the words that you right. say? Right. Is praise what makes it praise versus worship? Sure. No, I agree. Um, and it, we've that's the kind of discussion, mm-hmm. and that's where your generation's like, well, why is it? Our generation's like, yes, the tempo has something to do with it. Right. Your generation's like, well, why? Right. If they're pra- like, if this is what praise right. is, like, we're not interested in that. Exactly. Right. And it's like, so that's where I'm saying, like, perspective-wise, your version of praise looks different than ours. Yeah. So sh- do we just have to kind of get with the times and say, well, because it was very hard for my grandparents' generation to accept modern praise and worship. Oh, sure. my gosh, you got a guitar and a drum set? You know, right. where's the organ, you know, right. and the hymnals? You know, and they could not accept still some denominational people, right. like my friend Doug, well, Doug, who is a Doug, Presbyterian. Doug. They don't have modern praise and worship. You know, they use a hymnal and they have an organist, and there's they can, will not accept, not that they're against it entirely, but, sure. but it's on a Sunday morning, there's a specific structure and a way that they do things, and they... You have that's it. That's the way it's done, and it's more spiritual to have been because you talk to somebody from my grandparents' generation, and the hymns are a lot more spiritual than you know uh, ancient of days and sure. and awesome God. And then you talk to my generation, and ancient of days and awesome God, man, they're the stuff, and I love you, Lord, and right. and we don't really care about you know uh, the the songs that whatever you know. Uh, You're a good, good father. You know, it's like mm-hmm. to us, it's like oh, you know, it's an all right song. Right. You know, and we, I mean, I will give you, Rich Mullins was a fantastic song. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. <laughs> but I guess that there, you know, we had a distinctive understanding that there was contemporary praise and worship, 
and then there was praise and worship. And praise and worship was designed to be sung where everybody could relate to it. Well, that line has been blurred where there is no, really there's no such thing as contemporary Christian music anymore. Every contemporary Christian music leader is some kind of praise and worship leader and everything they're writing is sung on Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. Well, you didn't, you didn't hear, you know, uh, really didn't hear any Stephen Curtis Chapman sung on Sunday morning. We weren't singing, you know. Sure. Uh, we will abandon it all, you know, for on a Sunday morning. Of the for the sake. Now, as a special, mm -hmm. but, but this is something I've noticed, too, and maybe you can kind of talk about that. There's no such thing as specials anymore. No. We've well, cut those completely anymore, yeah. out. Yeah. Like, and it's not just this church. Like, every church I've been to. See, and I was going to say, though, that. that was a big thing in a lot of churches, was it? Like, Well, it, yeah. Oh, yes, okay. it was. But I think okay. it gave everybody an opportunity or an opportunity to sing these contemporary Christian songs in this setting to minister to people, but not realizing that they were not designed for praise and worship. Sure. And I think that's it. Like, I noticed Sunday mornings, as a praise and worship leader, 90% of the church isn't singing anymore. They're enjoying, quote unquote, if you can see the, you can't see the clothes, enjoying I see the worship he's service. Doing he is doing it. It has been verified. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> they're doing, you know, they're enjoying the worship service, but they're not participating mm -hmm. really. And I think that's something where my dad's generation and the hymnal generation, they were designed, even though the hymns would go from, to, you know, it was yeah. still, you know, it was designed to participate. And so I really feel like a lot of modern praise and worship is not really designed to participate. Not really. I think there's both. I do think there's both. But that's where, okay, and this is, I think I said this last time we did this, that, yeah. that I remember what Doc Wilson said. He said, as soon as you make worship, praise and worship about a how I versus a why, then you start excluding people. I agree with As that. soon as it's about how you worship, that. how you praise, then you're excluding somebody. That's he true. goes and praises and worship is not meant to be exclusive. It's meant to be all inclusive. I agree with that. So I get where you're coming from, where you're saying songs are more performance oriented and they're harder to sing. Harder to sing. I mean, and I, I know from being a, most men can't sing. Anymore. I know from being a praise and worship leader, there's the struggle is <clears throat> you've got these songs that are in the basement for the verses and then yeah. they're in the attic <laughs> for the chorus and the bridge. Oh, so God, you're like, Oh, what a savior. And everybody's like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> All the guys out in the, yeah, out in the like, congregation. Do I like, need surgery to <laughs> sing this song? <laughs> right. They're like, somebody come give me a kick in the groin. <laughs> yeah, so I can just <laughs> sing this song. Notes. And then the women are like, whoa, whoa, like, because it's so right. low all of a sudden. Yeah, and again, I blame Hillsong. Just like. <laughs> okay. We're, we're coming uh, for you, Darlene. We're coming for you. No. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to burn down Australia. No. Started with shout to the Lord. It did. No, but there was such a weird, uh, it was so weird, leading praise and worship in that generation. Mm. Uh, it was really hard because Christian Christian music, they, they just had a weird, like I would always say this, the Australian style that became the modern style now, like they would go up when I'd want to go down. And when I want to go down, they'd go up. And it was so hard for me to sing because the way they st the, the, the the way they changed keys mm. was so different. It wasn't natural. It wasn't yeah. natural to the Americanized version. Mm -hmm. And I had a real hard time with that. And then once you just kind of get used to it, then it's like now we have all these American sure. versions and everything is completely different structured to how we do it. So, But that's either here nor there. But again, how much of this is cultural? I think that's what you really have to get down to. Yeah. Like you said, I do believe praise is important. I don't think you should cut it out. Sure. And I do think that fast songs, they, they add something. Uh, being able to let go of yourself and encourage people to let go of themselves and just give to the Lord and throw everything aside helps prepare you, your heart, to then enter into worship. But what I find is when you jump right into this idea of worship, people are still holding on to all this nonsense that they used to kind of throw off during praise. Sure. And so they're trying to work harder, and then, then it's over. Like, you never really get anywhere. But then again, is it really about getting somewhere? Because I think we've elevated praise, me personally, this is my personal perspective, my dad might disagree. We've elevated praise and worship to a level it wasn't designed to have. It was never designed to be the end all and catch all of. Right, uh, like of, that of wasn't things. meant to be a substitute for intimacy with no, God throughout your life. It's not, like and we do it. Day -day like, yeah, life, or yeah. even just like we've made it so much more a part of like because you, you're telling me that they had this, they didn't have contemporary praise and worship. They didn't even have hymnals back when yeah. the disciples were there. So what does that mean? Like, what? why have we elevated it to this new level? 
uh, uh, like this level where it's so like we have worship services and we have oh summits know, yeah yes yeah. worship summits and we even have degrees now where you have to go get a bachelor's degree in worship leading. I could yeah. teach everything you know in worship leading in like an hour. Like you don't need to go and pay how you know, much? How much forty thousand for that? <laughs> I would. I'd charge. sign up. <laughs> <laughs> What I'm, you know what I'm saying, right. though? It's like well, this idea, because really what you're doing is you're going to school for music. You're not going to school for worship. Sure. But we had to justify charging people $40,000 and, and four years worth of school or whatever it is. So and uh, I, I am a professional worship leader. So therefore, I'm going to teach professional worship leaders. Even, even the idea that they would be paid. Like that sure. was not a concept oh, yeah. in my dad's generation or even my generation. That's a new concept that you should be on staff, that there should be a music person on staff like that Mm -hmm. when did music become that big a part like that wasn't it was there and we loved it but it was not it was like the worst the word was in the fellowship and and the moving of the spirit they were the important part the word music just kind of helped to facilitate that and it was like a secondary ministry but we've elevated it to this like mainstream like almost more important than every other form of ministry this music ministry Mm -hmm. and so but that really did kind of come from your generation. So to some degree, I guess more even maybe the end of mine. Before, yeah. But but what, what do you think about that? Like, where, where do you stand on that? Well, I think that I think that you have to think about what what are you trying to accomplish in a Sunday morning service? Right. So I think that's where the approach is coming from is what are you trying to accomplish? What is this service here for? And I think that the answer that most churches probably come up with is we're going to make a weekly just a touch point with our people um, so that they can be a part of a community and have some social interaction on a Sunday. We are going to do have a touch point with God in this this intimacy that we're creating right. praise and worship and a touch point with the word that we're giving. It's not meant to be the the it's not meant to fulfill all your needs. Sure. You know what I mean? It's It shouldn't fulfill all of your needs. If you can come to church on Sunday and then never have right. to talk to God again throughout the rest of the week. It's like, I want to go to that church cause that's right. probably that's called Catholicism. Amazing. Right. Yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> For those of my Catholic friends that are listening, I'm sorry that I just used you. Be blessed. Be blessed. Peace be with we you. We love you. Right. Um, so I think that's what it is. I think it's, it's what are you trying to accomplish and what is, what are those services? What are they meant to accomplish? So I think that's where we have a certain format because we're trying to do accomplish a task. And I just said accomplish like 30 times, but you're trying to accomplish all of those things within a certain time constraint. And I think that the time constraint, not that our church is like, okay, 1130, everybody get out. Like we're not, we're not done yet, but get out. But I think that that may be something just to make it more because everyone's like, oh man, if you get out of church, like after 12, it's like, I'm not going to that church. Like that turns people off from going to your church. Right. But my dad's generation would say that's, seeker friendly and sure. if you really cared about the holy spirit and about having a relationship with god sure. you sit it out so that's why i would say if you feel the holy spirit moving let it move but it's like here's where it all comes down is i heard a preacher say i would i don't care about growing a church i don't care about numbers i just care about having strong christians right and it's like and then there's other people that say well i'm all about the numbers i'm all about because that means that you're doing a good job why why can't it be both why isn't it both? Why isn't it something that's sure. approachable for someone who's never been to church before? Right. And it also, if God wants to take it somewhere else, we're going to allow him to take it somewhere else because he's God. Why can't it be okay. both? And I Absolutely think that's agree. where the moderation comes in again. Once again, the pendulum. It's like if we can get to sure. having both again, then, or maybe I say again, right. if we can get to that sweet spot. Sure. It's like everybody wants both of those things. Right. But but the problem is, is that every time I talk to my dad it's like this is the way that it should be and then every time you talk to pastor josh he's like well this is the way that it should not that he's totally not that they're both no, on this side, i'm going to talk like, to well maybe i'll talk to your dad too we're going to talk to <laughs> to both generations just, we're gonna talk to josh to too this. we're going to talk pastor yeah. josh we're going to talk to my dad or alan or more people sure. i want to do more even yeah. just more interviews with right. other people but why can't it be both that's all i'm saying why i, agree. I know, think I, it should be i both. do agree and i think that there is a reality to things change culturally yeah their culture was changing after the Jesus mm-hmm. movement, after the hippie movement in the 70s and 80s. And that cultural change was reflected in my dad's generation, mm-hmm. which there in turn, his parents' generation had a hard time with. Yeah. And I think it's the same kind of thing. There is a cultural shift. There is a change that some of it is good. 
I think some of it is okay and some of it I think is not as good as what we had before. Sure. But there is a reality that there is a cultural change. And so what should the church – see, that's, I guess, it. Like, my de- I guess you see this in every generation because my grandparents' generation said the church shouldn't change mm-hmm. to fit the culture. My dad's generation now is saying the church shouldn't change to fit the culture. But yet during their generation, the church changed to fit the culture right? to some degree. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do think that there needs to be – the church is a counterculture. Sure. So it should ha- – but, but – and I don't – I think one thing that – I want to talk about this. I think one thing your generation, too, is – what we're seeing, I think <laughs> what we saw was an extremeness. Like my parents' generation, we they developed a church culture. You had their own music. Their, and it became in the early 2000s. Now we had our own radio stations, our own television stations, our own film production companies. And we had the Christian world and we had the secular world. And we had our own version of arts and entertainment. And they didn't mingle. And we became exclusive. Mm-hmm. Like you had to, so if somebody came into the church and they liked the Bee Gees, they were, had to stop listening to the Bee Gees right. and only listen to Stephen Curtis Chapman because you don't listen to secular music. Uh, and this generation seems to be getting back this idea that that's not okay. That was not okay. That yeah. this exclusivity is not okay. Gotcha. That we should not be completely separate in the arts and in everything to where we have our own little world and they have their little world and they never mingle. Okay. So, I think. Oh man, I just had a thought. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming back. Oh, here it comes. Mm. So here's what I think. I think that the gospel already. You don't need to make the gospel rele- relevant, and you don't need right. to make it appeal to a broad audience because it sure. already does. Yeah. But if the goal is to get the gospel out to as many people as possible, why wouldn't you want to have a church? Now you wouldn't want to have a church full of compromise, but why right. wouldn't you want to have a church that appeals to as many people as possible? Agreed. You know what I mean? Because it's like that's the point is to get the message out. So the message is universal to any person. So if you can make your church as accessible, I guess is what you'd you'd want to say to the people yeah. that need to hear the message. Yeah. Why wouldn't you? Without compromise, of course. Right. Without compromise, sure. of the message. So, and I think that's where the disconnect is right. to the to certain generations. Mm-hmm. Some of the changes that are being made are compromise. Right. And to your generation, they're not. Like, wait a minute, what are we compromising? You know what I'm saying? Like, how is this compromise? And I think that kinds to tend to be where there's a disconnect. Yeah. Where it's like, what would, what, like, again, hats. Like, what's the big deal? Yeah. Or not, you know, wearing sneakers instead of dress shoes or wearing right. ripped jeans as opposed to nice, perfectly pressed jeans or singing all, you know, fat, three fast songs and two slow songs or never singing a fast song or, you know, singing only slow songs or breaking it up in between or what, you know, or having a coffee bar or how are these things compromising the yeah. gospel? That's where I think uh, the disconnect is to one generation, it's compromise, and to the other right. generation, it's not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that you also have to think about so. I would rather, I feel like Jesus came so that we could live for the why, not the how we live, but the why that we live Absolutely. and the why that we serve sure. him. And I've felt like growing up, I put this standard on myself of this is what a good Christian looks like. This is how they live yeah. their life. So that means that's not just that we're kind to of people where we have integrity, we have character. Those are the good things that my parents taught me. But yeah. the things that I imposed on myself or and that I have heard pastors say not our pastors but i have heard preachers say is you know i don't know how you could could consider yourself a christian if you watch this movie i don't know how you could consider yourself a christian you could call yourself a christian if you use this kind of language and it was all about building a lifestyle it was selling a lifestyle or a brand versus selling not even selling but sharing the the message behind the gospel sure which was acceptance which was forgiveness which was repentance yeah and absolutely it's love and grace but all of those things you have to balance and i think that's it's all right because there should be a change there should be and i think that's where you know to them that physical change showed the heart change and if you didn't have a physical change there was no heart change Mm -hmm. and and again i'm not you obviously everybody knows me (laughs) who knows me knows Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily buy into like I watch things most Christians probably would be like don't watch. Sure. You know, I've so, seen Breaking Bad. It's yeah, phenomenal, yeah. but I wouldn't recommend it to yeah, anybody. Well, same with Game of Thrones. Right. Except for the last <laughs> season. Well, I've never but, seen Great Game of Thrones. I'm better than Jay. I'm just saying. So just really quick. <laughs> I've never watched Breaking Bad. 
<laughs> so there. I get, <laughs> you know, but uh, next podcast is going to be yes. what's worse for for Christians? <laughs> which one? Breaking does, Bad or yeah, Game of Thrones? Right, this would be the thumbnail. Would say which one does Satan love more? more. Right. That's right. Actually, I think I want to do that. Yeah, you should. We should. We should, we should, should do should. that. Go like you know, right. which toy is more evil, <laughs> right? Man or you know, Thundercats. Like right. for my it's like what's what does Satan use more? Is it is it yeah. worse to be gay or is it worse to be a transvestite? Best I <laughs> oh, I want to talk about that. I should. We should cut that out because we I should. shouldn't say. No, transvestite. I should say out. a transsexual. Transsexual. Right, which yeah. which one is which one is? It's more, one of the thirty eight. Which one is one more thirty eight genders? Right. Which one is more hated by the Baptist Church? <laughs> <laughs> all equal. That is right. D. I think they're all equally. D. Hated. All of the above. Yeah, all of the above. Because I don't think they really like. There is no genuine like. But then again, let, there. Let's get back. To, let's get sure. into that too. Like, whoa. <sighs> we don't like to talk about homosexuality. Nope. We don't want to talk about it. Uh, and I had a friend recently at, that I was that I talked to at work, and he's an older gentleman, a little older than me, not a whole lot, older, a little older than me. And, and he had, apparently he had gone to church, and really he said I did the whole Christian thing and went to church, Pentecostal thing. Really, what it came down to, because I found out in conversation later on, his son is gay, mm-hmm. and uh, the, I guess they were he wasn't thrown out of a church or whatever. And there, that's their perspective. I don't know the sure. whole story. That's really the reason why he's not he won't accept Christianity anymore. Uh, is because oh they didn't accept my son who's gay. Well, there's a difference between between acceptance right. and tolerance. Like sure. you can love somebody, but you don't tolerate or you don't accept specific actions. Like where this whole idea of tolerance, for instance, in the in the church, the the, the liberal world has left has kind of uh, made its way into the church, where this idea that it, you're unloving if you're not tolerant mm-hmm. of something. Well, that's not true. Because we anybody who has kids will tell you I don't tolerate bad behavior. Doesn't mean I don't love my kid. Yeah. I love them, therefore I don't tolerate certain sure. things. So when it comes to homosexuality, yes, we want them to come to the church. We yeah, want them sure. to know that God loves them. Mm-hmm. But you cannot accept the behavior. You cannot say God loves you and you can just stay homosexual for the rest of your life. It doesn't work that way. Sure. Yes, God does love you and God God wants you, but if there is no change in your lifestyle, it's like God loves me, but if I'm a perpetual liar, that's going to need to be dealt with. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? God isn't going to accept that sure. any more than he would accept homosexuality. Uh-huh. Or if I'm a perpetual philanderer, God's not going to accept that either. Right. He, you can't come to the presence of God and say, oh, I just, I know Jesus loves me, but I'm just going to sleep with other women my whole life, and I'm never going to get married. I'm just going to cheat on my, or I'm just going to cheat on my wife constantly. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not going to deal with that issue because yeah. God loves me <clears throat> and by grace, and that's just my issue. That, see, that's one of the things that I, I don't believe your generation necessarily believed that. But I think there was an unbalance to want shift to one way with the millennials of this grace message getting too far over to the yeah. left. And we allowed the liberalism and the and the fact that a lot of millennials were raised in a liberal society more so than a conservative society, unless their parents really beat it into them. The educational system, the YouTube, the Disney Channel, the things you guys were watching were much more liberal than the things I grew up watching. Sure, but I feel like the church was was legalistic. Sure. That okay. So it was I, kind I of both. You had it right. from both. You had all of your schools. You had your TV shows. You had all of the world telling you one right. thing, and then you had the church, kind of on the opposite extreme, saying, "I'm not saying every church, but I'm saying sure. The no, but I know what you mean. Or certain churches. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I agree with you. See, and that well, whereas like the older generation would say, "We're not legalistic," you know. Yeah. So, I guess there needs to be a balance again too, and even in that, because sometimes we can teach our own convictions as and i think you see a lot of that our own convictions as law yeah and i'm going to hit on something drinking and smoking yeah which for my dad's generation are absolute sins Mm -hmm. but for even some of my generation and definitely the millennial generation is not it's not a sin to drink it's not a sin to smoke necessarily Mm -hmm. um it's better to stay away from both but they're not sins well they were preached as sins from me growing up like my dad's generation it was a sin but i can't find it in the bible sure and so that was uh, we really had a wrestling with that my generation did with this whole idea of well you know what like overseas like what uh what is true because then what is sin I'm sorry, it's I have to crack a joke and say that mail order bride's coming. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's at the airport right now. She wants you to come. I gotta go <laughs> right now. We'll take this up later. Ivanka's waiting for me. <laughs> Ivanka. It's probably Suki. <laughs> by the way, 
But um, you know, yeah, it's it's uh, yeah, that was so misogynist right there. That was bad. Oh my gosh. But uh, uh, <laughs> we're not misogynists. But um, anyway, no, I, I actually happen to come from a very long line of women, so yeah, it's okay. We can, we can say that. Turns out my mother was a woman. Her mother was a woman. Yes, mine too. And uh, yeah. yeah, everyone, ba- every mother has, I think, has been a woman from my mom's side. Yeah, so. mine too. Yeah. There were no uh, transvestites or mm. transsexuals. And True. No men giving birth. No men giving birth. Except, yeah. for me, except for my uncle, but he's. Well, you know. Yeah. 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 We'll talk about him in another podcast. Uh, another po- yeah, that, right. that's definitely. Right. We'll talk about the Nephilim. <laughs> <laughs> we will talk about the Nephilim. Okay, great. Perfect. Uh, Doug loves to talk about the Nephilim. Um, anyway, I just think that there's, there, there is a reality to that, that to this generation, certain things that were sins to my dad's generation are not. Let's just be honest. Yeah, and sure. so that's hard because to my dad's generation, you drink, you smoke in any way, shape, or form. You're a sinner. You're going to hell. You don't, right. you don't belong on the stage. You shouldn't be there. Because it was be associated with a certain kind of lifestyle. It was, absolutely. Yeah. And so this generation does not associate, necessarily associate with a certain lifestyle. Sure. So are they sins, or is it something that's cultural? Hmm. Well, there is a lot of black and white. I mean, the Bible doesn't say anything specifically. I mean, smoking wasn't really a thing then. Um, but But it was. Maybe not quite, you know. Maybe not quite the way we think about it now. Like people sure. are smoking six packs of cigarettes a day, but there were versions of smoking. Okay, yeah, I guess you, you could know. say that. Now, I mean, granted, the Bible doesn't have any scriptures talking about kidnapping, but we know that that's not a hobby that right. Jesus was doing on the reg. So, but is kidnapping <laughs> a sin? Well, that's what I'm saying. Is kidnapping <laughs> a sin? I don't, the Bible doesn't say it's a sin, so is yeah. it a sin? Yeah. Um, right. Th- there are certain things that the Bible doesn't quite specifically. Right. Hit on it now. does not specifically say, and I. I want to say that was probably on pur- purpose. It's almost like the, how the Constitution has always been yeah. taught to us in school. It's like it's the perfect framework. It's the bones. Yes. Oh, yeah. And they, they intentionally left it, you know, uh, without any of the good stuff, any of the meats, um, partially because they're not Arby's and they don't, they don't have Right. The we don't have the meats. Yeah. Right. We don't. <laughs> but the, I feel like the Bible is the same because I, well, I'm not going to pretend that I know the answer why, but it's like it, 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 is, it is an excuse to bring us closer to God and to ask him and Right. Well, I, John Bevere had said, I want to be so far away from gray that I can't even see it. Like, I want to be so far away from the gray area that I can't even see it anymore. I, can, I want to be so far away from the fence that I can't yeah. see the fence. And I think that there's some truth to that. Like, I will agree. My dad has made comments that there is a lot of mixture in the church now sure, sure. that wasn't there in our generational. And I do agree with him because I will say sometimes in my life I'm a little too mixed. And I allow some things in my life that shouldn't probably be there. Are they sins? No. But should they? are they really beneficial to my spiritual walk? No. Right. Like Game of Thrones. Sure. But, um, you know, so do I continue to allow the, if, if I were to cut more of that out and spend more time in the Word, would I, I develop a strong relation with God? Absolutely. Uh, and I know that in my dad's generation, because you see this now, too, I remember when I first started looking for a church after I had left uh, Florida and moved to Tennessee, it was really hard for me to find a church that didn't just have Sunday mornings, pretty much. And maybe maybe they did prayer on a Wednesday night. Maybe. And that right. was it. Like, they didn't do anything else. They had special services on occasion, but they didn't do anything. Because I was so used to being in church literally like three or four times a week. And and the idea of when I was raised was the idea was that the more you were in church, the more spiritual you were. Sure. Right. But Pretend the doors are open. You have to be right. there. And if you're not, you're not spiritual. But then you found that your family life lacked a lot. Mm-hmm. And I know you have a perspective on that. Uh, if you want to talk about that, I'll let you talk about that. But but I had a perspective on that. Now, my parents, I don't believe they didn't love me or they didn't, you know, they went to my baseball games. They did the things they could do. But there was always this idea that if something fell on a Sunday morning on a church service, we weren't going. Yeah. You know, right. Right. It was like church is more important and sure. going to church and being involved in church. That was being involved in the kingdom. Right. But this generation, <coughs> mine started it, I think. The idea was that being part of the b- body of Christ didn't necessarily wasn't necessarily determined by how often you went to church. Sure. Definitely, my generation sure. fell into that because we had people that just stopped going to church because mm-hmm. they're like, we don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Sure. I disagree with that. I think if you don't go to church, you're going to fall away. I don't think anybody can live this by themselves. But in the same extent, no, how often I go to church doesn't determine my spirituality, sure, or how effective I am in the world around me. But I will say the more I go to church, the more focus I have on the things of God, and the more my life tends to be that 
yeah. as opposed to the things in the world. And the more time I spend in the world and doing things in the world, the more that my perspective changes to that worldly perspective. So I, I, I see it I see it both. Well, I think sure. there's a balance, but I do think, you know, <laughs> there seems to be more of a balance in this generational to the idea that yes, church is important, but it's not the end all and catch all of everything. So mm-hmm. do you want to elaborate on that? Yes. Do you mind if I loop back to something? Because yes, while absolutely. you were talking, I had yeah. a thought. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you were talking about sin, and <clears throat> we were talking about we can talk about sin and hell if you want. I don't oh, care. great! <laughs> <laughs> it's my favorite place. The <laughs> devil. <laughs> well, drawing a pentagram. <laughs> True. He summoned a demon. It's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the nether portal just opened. There's it a dragon is, coming out. It is, um, yeah. So I was thinking about it, though, and it's like we, we tend to be very hard on sins that you can see. Right. And so what do you use? Wow, that's very true. Yeah. Very, very, so very true. we are very judgmental of people who are alcoholics, people who are homosexuals or drug people, addicts. Drug addicts. Yeah. Those are the hard ones. Those are like the Murderers. really strong. Right. Yeah. Right, right, right. Like those are like the unforgivables. And I think it's, you know, if you want to have a hard stance of of. Um, we're not going to accept that. We're not going to tolerate it here, blah, blah, blah. I think it's fair that you do the same with uh, people that are struggling with sins that you can't see because yeah. and how many people are not struggling with some kind of sin that you can't see? Well, that, I mean, that is the issue. Everybody is. Sure, sure. So, so for us to say, you right. know, this sin's worse than that sin, which worse than that sin. They're all the same. In they God's are. eyes, if you've broken Absolutely. one, you've broken them all. Which my parents' generation believed. Yeah, oh, for sure. I think did. it was just more of the idea of you couldn't, you could see, uh, not you could see that mm-hmm. a homosexual was not changing. Yeah. As opposed to you can't really tell whether the guy who struggles with lying is right changing. Well, or the I mean, guy it, who struggles with porn is sure uh, is changing, or right. you know what I'm saying? You can't. Or see it's that not it's not a sin often. that hurts other people necessarily. Right. So you're not yeah. there's not so much of a stigma behind it. But that's where sin is almost cultural. Yeah. Because we put there is a stigma on certain sins versus other ones. And I mean, what Which do we Which is very use? Catholic. Yeah. Very Catholic. Yeah. But we were told the opposite. Like, they're all the same. Like, the Bible says that, the you know, disobeying your parents is the same as witchcraft, which is what he's trying to tell us. Right. You know, or if you call your brother a fool, you're guilty of hellfire, of murdering him, really. Right. Is what he's saying. Because it's all the same. If in your heart you say, I hate you, you're it's the same as murdering him. Right. Like, it's, it's to God, it's, it's a sin. It's all the same. It all comes from the same place. And we were taught that. But in the same extent, we fall back into these ideas of some sins seem to be worse than others. Yeah, I agree. But, I mean, if we're going by the OG standard, which is the Ten Commandments, you know, it's like if you don't honor your your father and your mother. Well, homosexuality was not in the Ten Commandments. Was not in the Ten Commandments. It's true. But honoring your pa- your father and your mother are. It was, yes. And, well. And I know a lot of people that do not honor. I mean, I think a form of honoring your parents is to forgive them for the mistakes that they made when you were a child. Or if they you had a terrible parent, you still keep trying. Yeah. You still keep forgiving. You still keep. Yeah. I mean, in a lot of ways, my wife has dealt with that with her father and she's not given up on him. She hasn't given up on him and she tries her best to honor him. Sure. But it's like if you don't and you say, well, my dad was just a piece of garbage, blah, blah, blah. And you're not honoring your parents. That is, you broke one of the oh, Ten I agree Commandments. 100%. But it's I like agree that 100%. we're not going to judge people for. We're not going to, it's like, well, they, right. had, well, a rough, that's understandable. they had a rough childhood. Right. They were, yeah, they were wronged by somebody, yeah. so we're not going to make it. But it's so like, you can be unforgiving and bitter because it's okay. Sure, because, because you your had dad, right, because yeah. your dad hit you to a couple this times. person, sure. you can be, un- but to everybody else, you got to forgive it. I don't think, though, honestly, most of us wouldn't have taught that, though. Because, I, I mean, I remember actually pushing people to more extremes to forgive and to accept yeah. than I think we should have. Like, you know, you just stick it out and just, and, you know, they're coming to people. I'm not saying in this church, particularly, sure. but I've seen it even go to the extreme where, where, you know, you just submit to your husband and love him and he's beating the crap out of his wife and yeah. near death. And it's like, no, at that right. point, I think, oh, for sure. you know, because I wouldn't say my dad did that because there were times no, when I, I don't think it, it my ex-wife where, you know, her, her mother was like, I'm, yeah, time for me to leave. My husband and my dad was like, okay, you know, I, I understand why you're doing it. There was no judgmentalness. Sure. Because she had done everything she could mm-hmm. for her 30-something years or whatever it was to try right. and, you know. And uh, so, so I don't know if I lost my train of thought. Yeah, um, you got another one. Suki just came in, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm a Mormon. Belgeet. So, yeah. <laughs> Belgeet. <laughs> Man meat. <laughs> <laughs> that was La Kwanzaa. Okay. Uh, you know, but, um, you know, I think that, 
La Fonda. I was thinking about La Fonda from Napoleon Dynamite. Where he's standing there with a sign. She comes off the bus and he's got the do rag on his head. He's like, La Fonda. <laughs> oh my God. <clears throat> anyway. Well, just imagine though. Remember like the old fire and brimstone mm. preachers? Yeah. If they preached as hard about. Sinners in the hands of an angry God, one of yes. my favorite sermons. If they preached as hard about coveting your neighbor's wife or about <gasps> honoring your father and your mother as they do about homosexuality or as they do about drinking or smoking or it would be comical you'd laugh if these people I were think going though off that so there's a difference between like like and my dad has made this comment I agree with him it's becoming institutionalized though yeah. we have to accept it it's, it's like we can't even say anymore it's wrong Oh, well, you're hateful and you're homophobic. Right, 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 right. You know, it's like right. we have to accept it as mm -hmm. God loves me as a homosexual. Well, yes, but you still have to change. Mm -hmm. No, no, I don't because God loves me as a homosexual because he made me. Th it's this idea that he made me this way. Well, he yeah. didn't. If it's a sin, he didn't make you that way. He didn't make me a porn addict or he didn't make you whatever, you know, or he didn't make me a drug right. addict. He didn't make me a wife beater. He didn't make me these things. These are things I choose, whether it be cir circumstances in life that push me down that path. In the end, I still choose to be that. Mm -hmm. So God may love me just like I would love my kid. Mm -hmm. Who, If my kid was a serial killer, I'd still love him. Yeah. But I wouldn't accept the fact that he's a serial killer. I wouldn't go to him and say, you know, you're right for murdering people. And right. God just loves you f as a murderer. And he just made you that he way. He just made you that way. And that's what we're yeah. saying to homosexuals. Because we're not saying that to the drug to anybody else. We're not saying to a wife beater, God made you as a wife beater. But that's what homosexuality wants. Ho th that's what the society is telling us is what is what we consider a sin now. We have to accept as, as a fact of life. Like, this is who they are. No, it's not. You're not a homosexual. You're not. Oh, but I am, and you can't change that. And the idea that you can pray that off of me is is just is just wrong and and judgmental. No, it's God loves you. Yes, He absolutely loves you. He loves me with all of my faults. He loves you with all of your faults. But they're still faults, whether I like it or not. And they should change in the presence of God. He will help me change them. Well, it's the same for homosexuality. I will not accept it as an institutionalized, mm -hmm. as it is across the board, just the way you are. And God loves you anyway. No, I mean God does. Yeah. But you still have to change. There still has to be right. some form of change. But I do think you're right. There has been a, a hardness almost in that. But I think it has a lot to do with because it's being forced on us as institutional. We need to institutionalize it as yeah, it so is just a just separate, like LGBTQ mm -hmm. and the 17,000 different genders now. No, there is, there's only two genders. Right. There's, there's male and right, female. Right. There are not 32 genders. There's right. male and female. Exactly. You cannot choose your gender scientifically. There are only two. Right. It isn't going to be differently because your perspective. And I guess that's what I, I when I write books about this. That's kind of part of what my novels are about. Perspective doesn't that doesn't determine truth. Right. And that's where like which your perspective on something doesn't necessarily make it true. And my parents perspective on something doesn't necessarily make it true. But there is a truth behind it all. And when is it OK to say, well, that's just a perspective. Yeah. As opposed to that's an actual truth. You know, the doctrine, what is doctrine, what is truth, and what is just my perspective and culturally, like modern praise and worship is yeah. cultural. Really, it's cultural. It is not a, it is not biblical per se in the sense of you cannot go in the Bible and find thou shalt have a drummer and a bass player and, mm -hmm. you know, thou shalt pay them on staff and they shall be, you know, go to Bible college for four years to be a sure. praise and worship leader and we should have a music director on staff and we need to have thou shalt have a board with 24 channels and you know what I'm saying that's not found in the bible nor is it thou shalt only sing from the hymnal you see what I'm saying mm -hmm. and so but yet culturally we kind of make these things god they make them doctrines so what is when is it okay like I think that's part of my opinion where we're having a big disconnect because there's certain things that are cultural for your generation. Mm -hmm. There's certain things that were cultural to my dad's generation, and there's certain things that are cultural to my generation. Are they? Are they, I, I get back to Romans 14 because I really think that's what Paul's talking about. I think a lot of this has to do with is it really beneficial? Like, for instance, is it a sin to watch Game of Thrones? No. Is it beneficial to see that much pornography in a show? It's not. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. Uh, should it be there? No, it really shouldn't. Is it necessary? Absolutely not. Mm. You know what I'm saying? But am I sinning if I watch it? No. Am I being tainted for the rest of my life? Probably not. Right. 
you know, but to my parents' generation, you were. That was the whole the devil in the toy chest and the devil in the bookshelf. They had different books about that. The mm-hmm. devil in the in the video shelf, you know, in the video store where the movies you were watching and the books you were reading and the and the toys you were letting your kids play with were allowing demons into your house. You know. Yeah. Uh is there some reality? Sure, absolutely. Are there spirits that come behind any kind of art form? Absolutely. But were you going to hell because you watched Harry Potter? No, you're right. not. Is it necessarily beneficial? Maybe, maybe not. You know, I guess it depends on. But there are things that I think we're, Paul's talking about Romans 14 where he says, you know, I don't eat bread to idols. Because, or I eat bread to idols because it's just food offered up. It's food. It's going to go in my stomach. It's going to be destroyed. It's going to come out the backside. It's literally what he says. Mm-hmm. But to my brother... It was offered up to an idol and sacrilegious, and, and his heart condemns him. So he shouldn't eat it because his heart condemns him. So for him, it's sin. But for me, it's not. And I think that there's some, but I'm not going to, in his presence, eat bread that was offered up to idols because I don't want him to stumble. I don't want right. to cause him to stumble. And I think that's sometimes where we're having these huge disconnects because to my parents' generation, drinking is a sin. And smoking is a sin, and and wa- watching a radar movie was a sin for the longest time, you know. And and so we had the curse-free TV, and there's sure. nothing wrong with curse-free TV. Is it better yeah, to sure. not hear all those swear words? Absolutely. Right. But but it's like there there are certain people though that really is a big deal. And if, like for me, if I smoke, which I'd struggled with in the past, if I smoke, my heart condemns me. So I really believe it's it to me on some level it's a sin. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. But I'm not going to condemn, uh, but I can't look at somebody who has a cigar every now and then and say, you're a sinner. You're going to hell. Right. Because his heart's not condemning him, and I can't find in the Bible where it says, thou shalt not smoke. Same with drinking. You know, I believe the culture of going to clubs and getting drunk and, and sleeping around, and that's sinful. I don't believe that's a good way to live your life. Paul talks openly about that, constantly about that kind of lifestyle. But having a beer while you're watching a football game, I can't say that's a sin. I'm not probably going to sure. do it. But but I can't look at you and then say you shouldn't do it. But I do think that if you're if you know your friend is an alcoholic, you really shouldn't pop out that beer. Sure. And I think that there's that's what Paul's kind of talking about. I think we we want to make our own convictions into law, mm-hmm. and they're not. I think that's kind of what we see happening sometimes from generation to generation. It is becomes a law. My preference of. Uh, Doing praise and worship a certain way has become we make it a doctrine, not just that was my preference and that's just the way we did it and it worked. Well, it doesn't work in this generation, so therefore, but if it become a law, then then you're wrong. See what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And I think we do that even with sin sometimes. We we we, it's just my conviction and therefore, it's a sin for everybody. Well, it's not. There are certain things that are. Homosexuality is one of them, but. But, you know, I think Paul gave us in the Bible, that's where I guess I'm going to. Paul gave us an actual outline of how to handle this in the Bible. But we don't want to talk about it because our own, my own views become so important to me and how I relate to God. It must be law for everybody. And that's where I think we're wrong. That's mm-hmm. when you start getting into denom- like even denominationalism where it's like this is our preferential view and now it's law. You know, Baptist, you dunked, you didn't dip, you know, you didn't put it on their head, you dunked them. Right. So we are known as Baptists. That's law. Our general, my non-denominational groups, we believe that. But my f- friend Doug now, who is a Presbyterian, they don't dunk. They pour on your head. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Are they then not baptized? You see what I'm saying? Is it really about the f- ritual of it, or is it about the for- the heart attitude behind it? Mm-hmm. You know, so... But those things become law. They become our our view of things become law, and I think that's wrong because then it becomes unable to change culturally, and then it can't be relatable to another generation who does. Or you just go overseas. Like you were, to, if you were to go to Australia and tell them they can't drink, mm-hmm. they're gonna look at you like you're nuts. Right. You know, I can't drink. Well, who are you? You know, and yet America and the American church for the longest time, drinking was a sin. You don't drink. Again, is it better to stay away from drinking? I think it is. Yeah. Is it better to stay away from smoking? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Is it better to stay away from Game of Thrones? Probably. You know, uh, you know, because there is a lot of nudity in it, and I can't. You know, there's a lot of swearing. Condone, right, I'm sure. not going to condone that. If you that really should bother me more than it did. You know, well, it did actually. I, I watched the first season, didn't watch it again until it was pretty much over with, and then I got back into it because my son was into it and friends were into it, and I really enjoyed it. But in the same extent. 
the first season had way too much nudity for me. I was like, I sure. can't watch this anymore. Well, we always grew up with the analogy your mom would always say. She's like, well, just like a little bit of poop in your brownies. <laughs> and I always thought about that, and I was like, ew. Yeah, but there's truth yeah. to this. See, that, I agree with my parents on that. And that is kind of where there's a differential view. But what maybe to your generation, that's not poop. You see what I'm saying? And to my sure. parents' generation, He-Man was poop. Or maybe we like poop. Or maybe you like poop. You know, but I we, guess now I've got a taste for it. We like <laughs> do, poop. Yeah. I used to say it to my kids and be like, "What's for dinner?" I always say, "Poop on a stick." Like that was my go-to yeah. answer. So maybe this generation just—I I guess that's it. What well, each generation's poo is different, I guess. Mm-hmm. Like, but you see that. Like, you go to a cultural and you say. Uh, I'm going to eat raw fish. In Japanese, it's like, that's the greatest thing ever. In our generation, it's like, that's disgusting. Mm-hmm. Why would I? Why would an American want to eat? You know, Americans were like, sushi? That's nasty. Yeah. You know, and, and real advanced sushi is actually just a piece of raw fish without all of the rice and other stuff. You know, but to them, that's a delicacy. To us, it's like, that's gross. So, again, what what is cultural and what is doctrinal? And I think, in my opinion, we need to argue about we only need to we don't need to compromise in what is actual doctrine but what is cultural what does it matter whether it changes mm-hmm. so what do you right think? So as long as well i agree as long as there's not compromise and here's what i mean by that is <clears throat> i have known people that have said oh well i only i you know i don't do this i don't do that but they do that in their personal life sure. because they think that nobody knows right and then <clears throat> but it's like you would be ashamed of it if you found out that we knew. So right. it's like, d- d- isn't that enough for you to realize, like, you know what, this is probably an area of compromise in my yeah. life. If yeah. I'm not, if my f- good friends, if I'm not willing to say yeah. to my good friends, you know, I do this or I enjoy this or I like to watch this or like to do that, whatever. Then Well, I, I don't have a problem telling people I watch Game of Thrones. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. When I struggled with smoking, it was mm-hmm. hidden. I'm not going to talk about it. I'm sure. In front of people. And sure. I felt like my witness was being blown. I wasn't going to admit, hey, actually, I went out and smoked a pack of cigarettes. Right. You because know? to me, in my heart, smoking cigarettes is bad. It's not good for you. It's not a good witness. It's not. It's a sign of of compromise sure. in my life. But for me, Game of Thrones didn't feel like compromise. <laughs> I guess. But to my parents' She's generation, so it, it, yeah, <laughs> the poop was so good. It was so good. It, the poop had so much corn in it. It was like eating corn on the cob. It was like amazing. No, but yeah, but I get it. That's again, what is it's just so weird because I grew up not being able to watch He Man, not being able to watch Smurfs, couldn't have the toys, couldn't have Thundercats, couldn't have any of those stuff. And it's like, I, why? Right. It, that, that was like my generation's Harry Potter. You know, it's like, but what's the big deal? But yeah, I could watch Disney. Right. You know, with, with all sorts of magic. Oh, geez. I could watch Hocus Pocus, but I couldn't yeah. watch Pokemon. But you couldn't watch Pokemon. Right, right. exactly. Like, why Just, is Pokemon yeah. demonic, but yet Hocus Pocus is actually witches? Right. You know, and I think, you know, it, in context of, I, I think it really just comes down to you have to, uh, you got to determine what your convictions are on that. You've got to see where your kids are at. Like, I didn't let my kids watch Harry Potter until they were pretty much in their teens. Mm-hmm. I didn't let them watch them when they were little kids because I didn't, I didn't want witchcraft to be portrayed that way to in them. A, in like an approachable, an, an approachable, fun, yes. and give them like a curiosity about Right. It. Uh, yeah. I wanted until they understood the difference. But. My daughter was obsessed with fairies, and I had people who told me that my daughter, you know, that I was hurting my daughter because she thought fairies were real. And, and did she actually think fairies? Yeah, were she real? did when she was oh, little, okay. and she wanted to be a fairy instead of an angel. And I was demonic, like she was possessed by devils. I had someone actually tell me that, and I was a bad parent because I let her watch the Disney fairy. You know, so where do you draw the line on this? It's like right. everything that I don't like then becomes a sin to everybody else, and there has to be a line. And I think sometimes the clashes are where these lines are culturally. And uh, But this isn't a new thing. I mean, it's like every generation. But how much of the, I guess the real question is how much of this should change from generation and how much shouldn't? Because each generation says it shouldn't change at all, and then, they, then the next generation says, well, you're wrong. We're changing it. Like my dad said to his generation, and, and we're saying to them. And you know what I'm saying? Or whatever. You know, every generation says this. But yet, is there really any compromising going on, actually? <laughs> you know? Well, I think that you can't. <clears throat> See, I can't judge somebody's walk with God and say whether or not they're saved. You know what right. I mean? If they say, well, I'm a Christian. I believe in, that Jesus died for me, blah, blah, blah. I can't say, oh, well, I don't think so. But you can see fruit in people's lives. Yeah. And I th- And Jesus said, that's how you judge, is that 
you judge a tree if it's good or bad based off of its fruit. Agreed. And so you can see the fruit in someone's life. And if someone is a, a kind, generous, loving person who has peace and stability and healthy relationships in their lives, then that's probably fruit of the spirit. That's probably fruit of the right things. I agree. But if somebody has, I mean, and it can be a number of different things. You can have all the money in the world and all the success at work, have a terrible marriage, yeah. be a terrible father, yeah. Yeah, yeah. be have terrible addictions or, or even yeah. things that are just you're dealing with in your own life. Yeah. That's the fruit as well. That's Absolutely the fruit agree. of the decisions that you make. Yeah. And it doesn't mean it's not always the things that men look towards, you know, because we look at appearances and God looks at the heart and, most people that you look at, the appearance that you see on the outside is actually worse than uh, their actual life if you were to right. strip it all back. People go out now because you don't really go into public unless you need to go grocery shopping. But now that you're going out into public, you're even more so guarded and you're even more built up and you're even more right, well, uh, concerned about what people are thinking about you. Sure, so. because we live in a society where everything's on TV or right. everything's on the Internet. Mm -hmm. It's like the old adage that, you know, the life that is appearing on Instagram and Facebook is not really their life. Right, it's their highlight reel. Right, and everybody and is through a filter. Exactly, yeah. and everybody's like, well, my life doesn't look as good as theirs. Sure. Well, you don't know what their life really looks like. You're just seeing their highlight right. reel right. through their filter, which the joke, you know, how all women of my generation is in their 40s, and stop doing this, women. It doesn't look good. They filter out, whitewash their faces where you can barely see their yes. faces. It's like, woo! Yeah, it's like right. you look, and you're awful. like a, you look like a geisha. Yeah, it's like, like what the <laughs> heck? Like who, who works at the I mean, Chinese like restaurant? That, yes, it's like come <laughs> on, man. Like that is not what you really look like. It does not appeal to men. You are just trying to cover over all your wrinkles and whatever. Right. Just show me your wrinkles. Like I don't care about all that. Like if I want, if if I cared about that, then I wouldn't be looking at you anyway. Right. I'd be looking at a twenty year old. Right. You know, but I don't care that you got some wrinkles. Don't I? What I do care about is if I want to date you and I look at your profile picture and it's whitewashed. Like, that just says to me, Immaturity. like, you think yeah, you're sure. ugly, so I should definitely think you're ugly because you think you're ugly. Right. Because if you didn't think you were ugly and old-looking, you wouldn't do that. Just show yourself, you know? Yeah. It's like, seriously. Right. I, I don't care if you, you know, like I do, because I'm fat. I'll, you know, take a picture from up so that you right. can see my double chin. Sure. Like, that I get. Like, all when everybody does that. But I don't whitewash my face so you can't see my wrinkles and my zit. You right. know, it's like... Oh, no, these people on Instagram are professionals at hiding. I mean, you... There's there's pictures online. I don't know where I saw it, but it was like the Instagram picture versus like someone was taking a picture of them taking a picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like you see like you see this great picture of them like posing on the beach or something, and then like someone else is taking a picture of them. They're like surrounded by garbage, and yeah. they're like sucking in their stomach, <laughs> yeah. and like yeah. they're wearing these really like dirty pants. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Like these men with like their shirts off, but like they've got their like oh, hair done, and, yeah. like but it's like only from certain angles, and that's the thing that you don't see is. Yeah. All of social media, it's only from the lens and the angle that they want you to see. And how much of our church life, though, has fallen prey to that as well? Oh, probably, probably a good amount, I guess you yeah, could say. Yeah, because we, everything's online now, too. Like, yeah. my daughter, for instance, love you, Emma, but she doesn't go to church. She does online church. Mm -hmm. So does her mother. I, my dad's generation is like, that's not really church. Right. Well, this generation is like, how is that not really church? Because everything's online. All of our relationships are online. How can you say I don't have relationships when all of my relationships are online? Mm -hmm. You know, we. how often do we actually meet in person? See, that's one of the things about church that I think was so good and so important was the relational aspect we have. When you do online church, mm -hmm. you don't really have that. But yet to this generation, that is relationship. Sure. Because so it's like everything's it's, online. Right. I, you know, I, I text, I FaceTime, I... You know what I'm saying? It's like we play video games online. We don't we, like my generation. You couldn't play a game with somebody without them coming over to your house. If you wanted to have more than one player, you right. had to have more than one TV right. going at one time. Like you couldn't have like you, you could do the. I remember when the Nintendo 64 had four. Yeah, you baby. could play four at a time. Like whoa, you know. Before that, it was two at a time, and that was it. Now it's four at a time, and then if you wanted to have eight friends over. You had to have two TVs two with systems, two Nintendo right, 64s. Right. Yeah. And let's be honest, you were playing James Bond Goldeneye. We were, and, of course. An odd job was not allowed. It odd job was definitely odd. not allowed, nor the Golden Gun. Sure. But uh, <laughs> no odd job. No odd job. No fights. Golden Gun like, with one who hit. Who picked odd job? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, no, it was uh, definitely. But so this generation, they put my son playing online, talking to him while FaceTiming. And watching a video on another something. Oh, you yeah. Know? It's like a video up in the corner yeah. or whatever. I and can't watch TV without, like, having my phone. 
around. Oh, I know. It's so difficult to just like watch a movie without try it. Try watching a movie without touching your phone once. I know. I know. I at home it's really hard. Not in the movie theater for me. Okay, but that's gotcha. because yeah, movie true. theaters are a different true. experience for me. And you want to be but courteous it's hard to other less people. for my generation than yours. Like, mm-hmm. but what I'm saying that's my son's relationships. Like that. Yeah, not to say they never like he never goes out with his friends. But their whole, even dating, like nobody just asks somebody out and you go out anymore. No, you got to talk online for like five hours, like five days first. Make sure that your texts are, are right and get your attention through texts or emails. Then you got to FaceTime. Then you can go send up pictures. Then you can go out and meet each other. And then you don't look like the picture. So there's always that up front because you never look like your picture. And because you're using just the right picture with just the right filters, and, you know. Mm-hmm. And it's like, and then it's like, like, I don't know, I went on a date with a girl that I knew. Shouldn't say this. I'm not going to say this. That's why she's not listening. Come on. Okay. Yeah, she's not listening. So I went on a date with a girl, and I knew her from. What before. was her first and last name? <laughs> I knew her from before, and all of her pictures on her Facebook were all from like ten years ago. Sure. I'm like, wow, she looks great. Wow, you know, or or they were from this, you know, the up angle. Mm-hmm. She she was like seventy pounds heavier in person than she was in her pictures because all her pictures were older. And it's like I was like, whoa, you know, like it was hard for me to not that I didn't, you know. It was just like you don't look anything like the pictures. And so that's the problem. It's like your life doesn't look like it does online. But that didn't, that my generation, we weren't, you just met somebody and you went, you didn't start dating somebody until you were actually around them and got to know who they were. Okay. I just took a guess at who it was. I was wrong. (laughs) I can't, I can't say that. We can't talk about that. No. But um, no, it was not. But it, but you, but what I'm just saying is that that's not the that. first time that's happened. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, where even now, like uh, my face, I just changed it. But my Facebook profile picture was from like a year and a half ago. I was like sixty pounds lighter. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I'm fatter now. Mm-hmm. Uh, do I still look like that to some degree? Sure, but I can't even fit in those clothes. Right. <laughs> you know, I don't have the same clothes because I can't fit in them. Honestly, you I know, think it's better now. I think you look more huggable, more approachable. Oh, thank you. Thank and you. you could definitely break a fall better. So. I could definitely yeah. break a fall. And there are women that like big guys. Right. There are. Sure. And so you know, it, and I don't want to get thin, thin. But in the right. same extent, I want to. I would like to look like that again. Sure. But my, what I'm saying is, I didn't change it to the newer profile pics. So if I were dating somebody and I wanted them to check out my Facebook page, probably not going to see any of the fat pictures. Not like older fat pictures, but not newer fat pictures. Sure. Because I don't want to I don't want to come across as fat. Mm-hmm. You know, but in but my generation, you already knew the person was fat or not. Yeah. Because you just asked them out. You didn't there was no going and looking online from, you know, like 100 miles away. If you dated somebody who was 100 miles away, it's because you went 100 miles away and ran into them. Right. You know. So basically, there was no menu. It was it was a restaurant that offered two dishes. Exactly. <laughs> but but let's be honest. You grew up in a small church, yeah. okay? And you yeah. married a girl from the small. Oh, church. I did. Yeah. There is something to be said for this is what you have available to you, and you just accept that and you're happy with that. Yeah. Where this generation is never satisfied because there's always somebody better around the corner. Mm. So this whole generation, you could t- like I don't know, you go through hundreds of thousands of profiles on di- many different dating sites and it's like oh, i really like this person but maybe there's somebody better right around the corner right so you never pull the trigger where our generation was like well there's three i was three and i like right. this one you're like this one's too tall and right so yeah. i choose that one this or one's blonde, but so the bad yeah. thing was in that in this environment because i know to some degree if you were if you were one of the three and you weren't chosen then you were screwed yeah, you know, whereas you nowadays you have the ability to go out there and and meet online other people. Yeah, that you didn't have before. You couldn't do that unless you went to conference, and then you're going to conference with lots of other people, and you were still not the one that was chosen right. because they had. Because now there's more fish. Well, there's more fish. Yeah, more exactly. male fish. <laughs> exactly. There's a lot more, or female if you're a female. Sure. You know, and so, but yeah, I I do think this idea has crept into the church too, because like my dad's generation would say. That's not really church. That's not really relationship. There's no accountability. And my daughter's generation is saying, I'm sure there is. You know, this is just as good as anything else. This is how we do relationship. And there's a disconnect there, you know, because my daughter's generation is like, why do I have to go to a physical church when I can do it online? If I want to go, great, but I don't have to, and I can I can have life groups online, which my ex wife apparently goes to life groups online. They have oh, someone nice. to counsel online. Yeah, like they can okay. counsel online. See, I was gonna say that's a big aspect that you're missing is the fellowship, and you're missing <laughs> right. input from other people sure. that you trust into your life. But 
I mean, if you have that as well, I mean. Do you even need this at the structure anymore? But I don't know. I mean, what's also like, you know, you get in a group with 10 different people and it's like, are these life groups just like, okay, now I've got this life group leader that I'm going to talk to back and forth. Or is it like I can talk to any of the 10 people in the room? I really don't know because I don't do it, obviously. <laughs> but my dad's generation, that's sacral. It was like PTL. When PTL came out, that's not church. And people would go watch Christian television instead of going to church. Yep. And my dad's generation was like, you're not really going to church, and you're not really saved because you're just watching TV. you know. And so, But this generation, that's part of life. It's just that's relationships. You know, I have a hard time with that. I would rather meet face-to-face than talk online. I'm not very good at it. I don't want to talk online. I don't mind doing, like, you know, uh, Skype where I can see you and have sure. a conversation with you. But th- even though I'm a writer, I'm a terrible texter and emailer. So I'm not going to get your attention through email and text. I'm just not. I don't know what to say. But I will in person. I can talk to you in person. I'm texting a girl right now that I kind of like and used to like and could have gone somewhere. And I just feel like I don't know what to say through Facebook posts and stuff and should I push to talk on the phone because I'm just better talking on the phone you know but does she want to talk on the phone with me do I want to risk that rejection or you know what I'm saying? I just I mean I would say that. better find out now rather than later but well <laughs> but there's no again there's no accountability there's no like if it doesn't work out we just were t- who cares because you just fade away yeah you know you ghost but when you're actually talking face to face see that's another difference like when you're doing email stuff and you're doing online stuff you can ghost somebody very easily. When you got to see them every Sunday morning, you That's can't true. ghost them. That's very true. You know, you can't ghost mm-hmm. them anymore. It's not the same thing. You got to f- actually take accountability and talk to that person about why you don't want to date you them can, anymore. You can make up a story and say that you yeah. accidentally fell asleep or yeah, you had right. diarrhea. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> oh, I'm just really busy, so I'm not talking to you. I right was now. actually talking about you, but. Oh, yeah. Well, those two Sundays. Uh, <laughs> I had diarrhea. <laughs> My toilet can attest to that. <laughs> My stomach as well. And my rock and then behind. You, <laughs> <laughs> then you fell asleep the one Sunday, so you said. Well, that I did too, but I worked like two doubles in a row and didn't sleep on Saturday. So I. A likely excuse. You know, yep. fell asleep. What do you expect? Uh-huh. I have to sleep. Uh-huh. It's like I told uh, you guys last night, you know, I'm psychotic enough. I don't need to add lack of sleep to that. True. <laughs> then it's really psychosis. You know. But anyway, there is, though, again, where do you stand on that? Like, as far as, do you think it, that church should go more? I mean, obviously, we have online. Mm-hmm. Do you think that it, we sh- what? How do you feel about this? Where's your, you know, like, my dad's generation is, why is that camera there? Why do we have this online? You know, mm-hmm. that's not church. They need to be in church. Right. You know, your Their general, opinion would be it discourages people from coming. Exactly. Because I don't have to. Because I, right. I can. Because I don't have to. Right. Online, I can watch right. it online. Right. I mean, if that's all the church. But then again, I mean, for our church, we're literally just doing the message. Sure. So no, you're, I, you're missing yeah. praise and worship. You don't have the weekly, you know, the Wednesday night groups. You don't have the Monday night groups. Right. Men's groups. Um, you don't get to eat at the cafe afterwards, which I think is a great benefit, by the oh, by. I love the cafe. Cafe is pretty great. Mozzarella waistline sticks. waistline loves the cafe. Who else is sitting in sanct- is sitting in their sanctuary on a Sunday when you just smell mozzarella sticks? Yeah. The smell just fills the sanctuary. You feel the glory cloud come down. <laughs> and, and as but soon then you as get out there, <laughs> and they're like, we're almost out of mozzarella sticks. But well, we have chicken fingers, but I didn't want chicken I, fingers. I should say because when you get out there, <laughs> because usually you talk to three or four people before you go out there. That is and true. when Jay talks to three or four people, that's about 40 minutes worth it of is, talking, it is. even if it's just saying hello. So, it is. You're right. Or it could just be one person, one person in particular that you just talk to for maybe 30 Torrent. or 40 minutes, right? But yeah. Yeah. So what's my opinion on that? Well, <clears throat> I don't know. I haven't really thought about it. I, it's definitely – look, I think – the church of the future is probably going to be virtual reality church. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. You're going to sit at home. You're going to put the, the goggles on, the but Oculus, I guess, whatever. Like, I, I get you. But my yeah. generation kind of thinks like the Robert Tilsons out there with like, I'm waving my, you know, my uh, my <laughs> handkerchief at, the, at the, the television channel and you're going to feel it in your house and fall out right. in the spirit. Like that is that really what? Because like there is a sense of the presence of God, like. Even just from the front to the back, like if you sit in the back, you real there's like, I really feel like the presence of God just seems stronger up in the front to some degree. It's probably just a perspective thing, but but like well, sitting in at home, reality, we'll all have a front row seat, <laughs> so that'll be the best part. Yeah, but it's literally not Stephen Furtick. He'll probably be in his fifties, but he'll still be just as jacked, <laughs> and he'll be right in front of you, 
and like there'll be a little like you'll feel the spit on your forehead. <laughs> It'll be like the four D at Disneyland, right? <laughs> yeah. You'll have like a little chair right. that you sit in with glasses and like you know, like Mist. when the Holy Spirit comes through, you'll feel the wind, right. you know. And there'll be like a little scratch and sniff car and there it's like be, yeah, I yeah. feel this I smell smell <laughs> the rose of Sharon. <laughs> the, the sweet aromas of heaven. Heaven <laughs> It'll spray like cologne. <laughs> Heaven's bakeries cooking but up then something <laughs> for you. Scratch, scratch sticker number four. Like mana would fall from the fruit. Right. Mana falls You're down. You're just like, open your mouth, mana will oh. fall into <laughs> This is the church of tomorrow, I'm just saying. But then wouldn't we, we'd be exactly the same as the old, like, worshiping of the gods when, like, in the temples, they had, like, all these weird contraptions to make sounds and noise and, you know. Like, isn't that the same kind of, like, no, it wouldn't, wouldn't really happen, I'm just saying. But that isn't that though. Like I think that's the way my parents' generation feel like it's heading. Yeah. Like in their minds, like that we're just one step away from that. Right. <laughs> it's like we're one step away from Wally, where they're like in the <laughs> chairs everywhere, and it's just like church happens on a little hologram on your chest or on your on your beer belly, like the pastor yeah. just pops up. Yeah. Oh, I could see that. Yeah, I could see that. I too. mean, again, is that is there anything wrong with that though? Because culturally and technology is changing is it evil right again that that's i guess the real question there is it evil though well let me ask you this because in the early church in the book of acts didn't they all live together they did they all live like a commune yeah we don't do that we see each other once or twice a week yeah we don't live together and it's like i can understand where in the beginning in the early church it was like a a family and i can see why fornication and like adultery might be a harder problem then sure if you're all living together you're sure, like, dude, she's hot, you know. Or you're like, you know, you just get comfortable walking from the shower to your bedroom yeah. with just yeah. a towel on, and <laughs> yeah, no, but seriously, think about it though. If I like, if I saw, like, say you, you lived with the people yeah, in the church, like, all there, the time. there have been friends that their wives were gorgeous, you know, and like, I really they were we really got along, but we don't see each other that often, so it's not like like we sure. do, but like, if I saw them every day and had to live with them, that might cause a problem if they liked me the same, like, felt the same way sure. about me, like, you know. It's not a matter of like, wow, you know, I never thought about that. This just took but a really that, weird turn. It, but but yeah, yeah, but yeah, think yeah, about no, it, though. Sure. Like, I never thought about that. But wouldn't there be like an increase in sin problems, though, if you like all lived in a commune together? Like, that would be a harder. <laughs> it'd be really hard not to like, it would be a lot harder than I'm just going to go home, you know, by myself. Like, right. I guess you could see how there would like, it just makes me wonder, because like, if you ever read some of this stuff, like. Like, one dude sleeping with his mother, and, like, Paul yeah. has to, like, talk about, you know, like, that's accepted. Like, why are you letting this dude sleep with his mother? Like, even church discipline would be, like, I could see how that would be more extreme. Like, throw the guy out. Right. Because he won't deal with it. Like, here, we're like, throw him out. We only see him every once a week. Right. Like, I don't you care. Know? I only see him for an hour and a <laughs> yeah. half on Sunday. Right. But to them, <laughs> if you saw him, like, every day. You know what? I never really thought about it that way. Yeah, but that would be a so hilarious true. sitcom. It would be a hilarious <laughs> sitcom. That would be a great sitcom. Yeah. But I could see that now. Like, that, even homosexuality would be such a big deal because it's not like, okay, I get to, I have to see him on a Sunday morning for two hours and maybe a special service. No, I'm living with this guy who's sleeping with another man. Yeah. Like that would be right in your face. And then it would be like, dude, you can't do that. Like, seriously, I don't want to see your you guys hump in the court. Like, (laughs) but no, when you think about it, though, like when you really think about it, like that makes a lot. This is where part two of the podcast starts. (laughs) We're just going to go off. We're really off on a tangent now. And it's almost time. (laughs) We've already like two hours in. Right. Almost two hours in. But um, no, but think about it. Like, I guess. Wow, that's a, that's definitely something I want to talk about. So the church is changing, the but it already has changed from what it was in the early church, right. which is people use as an example of, well, this is the early church. This is the way that yeah. Christ intended it. Yeah. It's like, well, we already did change, yeah. and then it will change again. And <clears throat> as much as everybody, a lot of older people hate the praise and worship of this generation, buckle up. If you're alive for another 20 years. Like you're going to really hate the yeah, next generation. Gonna, I'm probably going to hate it. Yeah, but. you're going to be like your kid's generation, baby, dutcher. We'll be like, uh, yep. whatever the name is yet. Baby Dutcher, you'll be like, I can't stand your praise and worship. Right. It'll be like a series yeah. of like clicks and like <laughs> moans or something. Who knows what right. it's going to sound right. like, what music is going to sound I just hope it's not rap. <laughs> 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 yeah, because if I walked into like Elevation Church and they were rapping, I'm like, peace out. I Seriously, don't care. I'm sure they rap. They already I must. Can't, uh, I don't think in the we had a rap stuff. in my church in Tennessee. I was going to for a while. The guy like did like a praise and worship song, and he just started rapping, and I was like, oh, I hate this. 
Right. But you know, culturally, which you know, sure. there are a lot of people in that really appreciate it. Yeah. So we we wrestled with some of that with our praise and worship because I or, as a I was a youth praise and worship leader for like I don't know fifteen years, whatever it was, and uh, we were in inner city Tampa. They could not relate to Hillsong. They could not relate to the style of music we were playing. They, w- they and we didn't have like anything that they really could relate to because they liked rap and they liked R and B and they liked hip hop and it's like I couldn't sing that for one. And we tried to incorporate some stuff every now and then in, and they would respond. But it's like again, is it wrong though to to culturally tr- to 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 tailor our praise and worship to the style of music that they like? No, I don't think it is because that how are you going to reach them? They're not going to be reached if we're doing, you know, st- singing Stephen Kirsch Chapman mm-hmm. songs and they're not from the country. You know, they right. even my brother hates Stephen Kirsch Chapman. Right. You know, not that I ever sang in a special minister to him because he can't stand Stephen Kirsch Chapman. Well, you know, there's you another know? church in our area that's doing pretty well and they sing songs. Like, <clears throat> that's right. Nobody's, they're not going to hear this anyway. Yeah, but no, probably not. I mean, but they sing, um, what's that song? Uh, He's a good, good father. Zach Brown? No, not Zach Brown. I don't know who it is. It's not. Oh my gosh, it's not Zach Brown. I just oceans are singing oceans. No, 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 no. They're singing the the chain breaker song. Oh, if you got chains. He's a chain breaker. Yeah. If you got, he's right, a yeah, prison yeah. shaking savior. Yeah. If we sang that here, people would throw up. Yeah, they would. Like yeah. they'd be like, "All right." I'm, well, for one, I can't imagine you or Lexi trying to sing that song. No, I wouldn't. I would. I, I might be. Didn't. Hold bad. on, I could probably pull it off. But you two, it would or Scotty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Scott would be so uncomfortable. I love you, Scott. But oh my god, yeah, it would be like one of those. I remember. Okay, <laughs> and I don't think you have to know him to like get this like, story. Oh, it's like when my dad. Do you remember this when my dad sang um, <laughs> the Stephen Curtis Chapman song, the cowboy one? Uh, this is a great adventure. Oh my god, it no, was so I bad. It was I, I love your dad, but it was awful. Like <laughs> it was. It was so funny because he didn't. It's not his style. Yeah, it just didn't suit him. Go ahead. What were you saying? Um, well, I was going to tell. There's this. Actually, I'm not going to tell that story anymore. But it didn't make <laughs> me think about. <laughs> Made me think about. Patrick. Alan, we love you, but it was probably involving. No, you. it was about Scott. It was about Scott. <laughs> was he was Scott, Scott was doing. Oh, whatever. I'll just tell a little bit. Scott was doing praise and worship, and it was around Christmas, and it was like. <laughs> The Christmas is like the bane of every worship leader's of existence, which it really should. At least it we don't be. have to sing Rudolph. I had to sing Rudolph. Oh my every gosh, year. that's terrible. That's awful. I that's bad. Rudolph. That's mm. I can't sing that song anymore. I just yes. I want to puke every like time. Some, I some Methodist crap. <laughs> 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 anyway, so and they would have like it. They would have been like, "This is how Rudolph <laughs> represents <laughs> the Trinity." <laughs> Martin Luther. <laughs> <laughs> Thou shalt sing Rudolph. It was in his ninety eighth thesis, nine or ninety seventh thesis, nine nailed to the Catholic wall. <laughs> right. So <laughs> Scott was doing it, and I remember he was like trying to. He's like, fine. He's like, they want Christmas. They want like high energy Christmas. They want like I'll give you exactly what you want. And it went over so bad. <laughs> it was so bad, and it wasn't because of. He's very talented, <laughs> but it just went over so poorly. And he's like, never again. He goes, never again. It was it was literally it was after that. Scott's like, I think I'm going to take a break. Sure. Take a break from leading because I'm just like so I felt over. that way after having to sing Rudolph for the 17th Christmas in a row. Jesus. Or Feliz Navidad. No, you didn't. Feliz Navidad. Did well, you sing that for praise Oh, God, I had to sing that all the time. That until we got some Spanish praise and worship leaders, and they had to sing it. But when there weren't any that were actually right. on the praise and worship team, I had to sing Feliz Navidad every year. Mm. They're like, Jay, do you like spicy rice? You're like, I do. <laughs> They're like, Feliz Navidad. <laughs> Can you speak Spanish? See. Si. See? Si. No habla español. That's enough. Feliz Navidad. <laughs> yeah, that passed. So, no, but what I was going to say was when Pastor Mary was here, I mean, she was probably in her, was she in her 60s? Uh, By the time they left. I've known her since she was in her 40s. Mid 60s then, I would say, before they left. And she would start singing. It was like late 2000s. And I remember the song Happy Day. You remember that song? Oh, Happy Day. Yeah. Yeah. The greatest day in history. Yeah, yeah. And she'd be singing that. I can't sing it either. Right. And she's like all jazzy and bluesy and like she's trying to sing the song and make it work and and it was just like okay like this is it's too far we've hit a new low yeah yeah just stick to what you do mary that's that's, which is one of her songs was was taste and see that the lord is oh yeah 
but then she added a line. In it. it actually wasn't that song. It was a different song, but she would say, no, no, not that one. Oh. Mm-mm. But she had a line in one of her songs uh, that said, then you kiss me as we dance. Oh, okay. Yes. So, which was very. Well, I mean, that's not. A, I mean, they had a, what was the one song where uh, the one where they said kiss like a sloppy wet kiss. Oh, yeah. We always uh, change that. David Crowder. I hate that song. Just let you know. Uh, how he loves that. us. How oh, he loves I hate us. that song with a passion. I okay, see, but I listened to an interview. Um, oh God, I hate that song. Where uh, <clears throat> Jeremy Riddle was mm. talking about, and he he leads for Bethel. He was talking about how when that song first came out, he said they would sing it, and all the old people would be like, "How he loves us." Oh, and they'd be like, "This is such a selfish song." He's like, but then at the same time, you look out into the crowd. There'd be teenagers who are crying. If it was done at like a, absolutely. a youth no, conference, absolutely they'd agree. be crying, like absolutely bawling agree. their eyes out. And it meant something different to them. It did. It absolutely does. I hate it, too, because I think it's a whiny, whiny baby brat right. song. And yet, when I would sing it to the pres- to in youth, they loved it. They would cry, and God really moving. And I'm just like, okay. I guess there is some reality to that. Like, I'm going to sing that next time I leave just yeah, to make you, you upset. That or Oceans. Don't sing Oceans. Oh, I'll never sing God, Oceans. Oceans. My Lord. No song has been beat to death more than Oceans. I mean, I'm sure there is, but my Lord, Oceans is beat. Well, he's a good, good father. He's pretty beat to death. But, but uh-huh. oh, my Lord, Oceans. They're still beating Oceans. Like, it never goes away. It's going to be there forever, Oceans, mm-hmm. until the continents shift. Mm-hmm. Then there'll just be a different ocean. But, right, until but all I could the water is evaporated from the earth. Yeah. <laughs> there are literally no more Oceans. Until the next ice age. <laughs> I, and then it would be Iceberg instead of Oceans. But... Um, I could song. sing, oh, what is the one? Uh, oh, dang, it just went out of my head. The one that we, Carrie Job was known for. Uh, the Lamb. Oh. Forever? No. No. The uh, Revelation song. Oh, I hate that song. Yeah. like I, Yeah, see? Every time I think of it, it's like Phillips, yeah. Craig, and Dean. Yes, but I could pull it off. I could sing Revelation song and people would just like it didn't matter. We just sing it right now. But then. Steve, the other praise and worship uh-huh. leader, was younger than me. He couldn't sing it. Hate that Every song. time he sang it, it just went <laughs> right down the tubes. And so I guess you know I think there is something. Just everybody has a distinctive personality, and sometimes it just comes through. And mm-hmm. what works for you isn't always going to work for everybody else. And again, just to bring it back comp- to what we're talking about, that is the church sometimes. What do, what works in upstate New York isn't going to work in in Nashville, Tennessee, and what Very works true. in Nashville, Tennessee, might not work here in Green. You know, one of the biggest problems I had was I felt like there were nobody up here in Green that in this area that really clicked with me. I still have a problem with that. It's a bunch of uh, you know a lot of them are just farmers and hunters, and they're pretty basic people, and they don't want to talk about anything deep or anything cultural. They don't care about all that stuff. And then, but you know, I run into people that do on occasion. But I went down Florida, and there were tons of people that were like that. You know, Tennessee yeah. even. But even Tennessee, there were different people there, and there was a certain thing that worked in Tennessee that isn't going to work anywhere else uh, because it's just a different environment, different people, different cultural ways of doing things. Uh, and it's different culturally up here. So how much of that, to, to, to wrap this up, because we're getting to the end of this, we're two hours in now, mm. uh, probably going to break it up into two. But where, where we, where I believe... Sometimes it's just a matter of perspectives, like what your generation perceives as opposed to what my dad's generation perceives. And I don't think either one is wrong or right. I think there are just different perspectives on things. And and we perceive things like my my dad's generation or my generation might perceive, well, you cut out praise from praise and worship. But you don't see it that way. It wasn't that you were trying to. You know what I'm saying? There right. was not this intentional perception. So you perceive things differently, and then you're like, well, we do praise. It's just we don't sing fast songs all the time. You know, we don't necessarily dance and shout the way your generation did. And and so it's a lot about perceptions instead of opposed to what is true and what is not true. That there is a basic inherent truth that all generations carry that call themselves Christians. But there are things that sometimes are just preferential that change, and they change from person to person, from generation to generation. And those things we shouldn't be afraid to allow to change. Because we're not going to reach the next generation if they don't change. Right. Because the next generation is going to change. They're yeah. going to be different. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And their perspectives on things are going to change. Yeah. But if the basic truth doesn't change, if we don't sacrifice that, if we don't compromise the truth of the gospel, then 
That's that's the more important issue. Because, again, I think sometimes we just make our own preference law and doctrine. And and, it can, and your generation has will have the same thing. You're going to get your kids, you're going to be like, oh, you know, this is the way we did it. This is the way it should always be done. And and you're going to be right on some things. And, and your kids are going to have to find that out. I will say one thing. As a father of millennials... <laughs> They, more than my generation, want to make their own mistakes, and they don't want to listen to what we have to say. Mm. Emma, I love you. But I think sometimes... Why won't you listen to your father? Why don't you to me? <laughs> We're like my generation, I think, although Josh, I'll say, my, I guess maybe his personality, but it just seems like my dad's generation, they made their mistakes, and they had to make their mistakes, and they really didn't watch their... They come, came out of, rejected a lot of their parents... Uh, wisdom because they didn't like a lot of what their parents did. And every generation has a tendency to do that. And I think my generation actually is the least to do that. It's probably why we were considered the lost generation in a lot of ways. But my, I see this a lot in my daughter. Uh, doesn't want to listen to my mis- me telling her about, like, I know this isn't going to work because I tried it. No, I have to figure it out for myself. Right. Or like, well, I need to try it my way. My way first. Yeah. And, and you see that in in socially with liberalism the our older generation says it doesn't work and this generation says well let us try and make it work Mm -hmm. and until we try to make it work and fail we're not going to listen to you and the older generation's like but you're going to destroy it you're going to destroy everything in your attempt and the newer generation's like stop being you know so you know stop being so black and white it's not really what's going to happen stop being so extreme but but yet that's kind of to bring this to a close, mm-hmm. kind of how the older generation is viewing the church. You're going to destroy it. Hmm. And then the younger generation is like, no, just let us figure this out and see if, if we fail, we fail, but we're not going to destroy the church by trying, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. to, to change some things or to, to make things work our own way and find our own way. And then the older generation is like, no, you, we've already tried that and we know what works and doesn't work, so you need to listen to us. And I think there needs to be a balance. I think the younger generation needs to listen to the wisdom of the older, and I think the older needs to allow the generations certain things to change culturally mm-hmm. or to, gener- to fit a generation. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's going to be the end of this episode because we are two hours in. It was a lot of fun talking to you. One hour, 55, 56. 56. One hour, 56, 56 minutes. minutes. Been on for a long ride. It was a fun ride, though. Yeah. I like this introduction. We're going to do more of this. Uh, Maybe I'll even interview Jonathan again later. I definitely want to interview some more millennials, some uh, more than just one of each generation. Uh, We're definitely going to get some questions together. I want you to help me with that. Uh, Make up some questions on what I want to ask each generation so we kind of have a uniform across the board, and this is what each one I want to do. But this was a good introduction to the series. It was just a good conversation. I hope you guys enjoyed it. As always, uh, if you got any questions, if you got anything we'd, you'd like to see us cover, if you got any prayer requests, you can reach us at the Christian Sages at gmail.com. Uh, pretty much all I've been getting lately are Twitter, Twitter telling me that you know Twitter updates, Some tweets, uh, tweets. So, uh, but if you can, you can contact us there. The 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 Christian Sages dot com website is still down. We are updating it. So my daughter is coming for Christmas, and we will be updating that. It'll have a whole completely new look with a lot of new stuff going on. You can still reach us on the YouTube channel, which is the Christian Sages. You can find us on YouTube if you type in the Christian Sages. We'll come up. Uh, you can find us wherever there, wherever you get your wherever you get your podcast. You can find us. Uh, we're going through Anchor FM now, so we are now on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, just about anywhere where you can find a podcast other than Podbean. You can find us. You can find some older episodes on Podbean. You're on Spotify. We are on Spotify oh, now. No way. So you can find us on all of those places uh, just by typing in the Christian Sages. I d- don't check them, so I'm not sure whether you're leaving comments. Um, if you'd like to leave us comments, I would just say for now, please just email it to us or when the website's up, go to the website or go to the YouTube page. And if you do go to the YouTube page, please like and subscribe. Uh, that way we know that you're listening. And leave us leave comments so that we know what things you don't like, what things you do like. I already got uh, somebody asking me, a friend of mine, asking me to do something on spiritual warfare. So we're going to do that uh, the next couple episodes so I can let you know what's going on. The next couple episodes we're going to be doing is we're going to redo uh, the New Age because the audio didn't come out. We're going to do Islam because... Obviously, that's a cult. Duh. So, duh. <laughs> so we're going to be covering Islam. We're going to be covering the, covering the paranormal and how that relates to the church and the rise of the paranormal investigators. And then we're going to be doing two more uh, upcoming um, 
at least two more interviews with generations. One, since I just did a millennial, we'll probably do my brother's generation or my generation and then my father's generation and try to get <coughs> three perspectives, and then we're going to do more of that. Where And if you have any questions, please email the questions to us. Let me know what you want to know. Like if you want to ask Jonathan something and you're an older generation, Alan, if you wanna, if you wanna ask your son something, send us, send us, drop us. Or you can call. Or you can call. Yeah, you can call me. Call. Jeez. <laughs> or you yeah, can just use me as a medium. It's a lot more fun. Yeah, it is but, a lot more fun. You know. That way, I want to put a challenge out there. <laughs> if this video gets a hundred thousand views, okay, Jay and I will wrestle each other. Uh, I'm not gonna say butt naked, no, but I will say. Well, maybe for a hundred thousand. Yeah, for hundred. Uh, no, if we get to a million, then I would. Okay. Then yeah, I would. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now you know what our. But I'm just saying, <laughs> right? That's <laughs> it's actually not a lot. <laughs> not really. Not. <laughs> but a million views is a million views. So I'm just saying. But we I, are, I'll, at yeah. least I'll put a picture out there. Look, if you want to comment something, I will fight you in the comments. <laughs> I'll be watching this video and this video only for the comments. If okay. you want to fight, okay. if you want to have a disagreement, if you'd like to be, um, what is it that everybody posts the. Uh, uh, social justice warriors. Oh, if you're owned. an SJW, yeah, and you don't you like. Want, and you'd love content. to get, you'd yeah. love to get owned in the comments. I have some friends that can back me up. Yeah. Um, yeah. So if you'd like to talk to me in the comments, uh, bring it on. If we get to a uh, hundred thousand, I will, I, I will fight Jay without a shirt on. Okay, that, that, million, works. that works. Then we will both completely be. We'll actually room. do a video so you can see how white and pale I look yes. like an albino ape. Just so right. You know. <laughs> like, like I mean, I, Jeremy. One of our friends looks like an orangutan with his shirt off, but mm. I look like an albino ape. Right, and I, I'm about I'm like an albino thing. ape that rolled in a little bit, of, like just fell in dirt real quick. <laughs> uh, just more red, actually, more red-looking <laughs> ape. Yeah, I just wanted to have something memorable at the end of the episode to say. That's all, because the first time we did this, I was trashing Doug the whole time. I don't even know Doug. Sounds like a great guy. <laughs> you know, oh, he's a great guy. Yeah, great guy. I was just saying he, he he gets a new he gets one of our. We actually made some T-shirts. Uh, it's just a prototype, but once we get something down and we get enough, that, that's what we'll do. If we can get to 100,000 likes, mm -hmm. I will give away a free T-shirt. One free T-shirt for 100. <laughs> or, you know, <laughs> I'll make T-shirts. I'll give away a bunch of T-shirts. Yeah. But, we, you know, we need so to. So just get but, you but here's the thing. Not just 100,000 likes. We need 100,000 subscribers. If we get to 100,000 subscribers, I will give away a bunch of T-shirts. If this could become our new full-time job, yes. I will give at least somebody $10. Yeah. <laughs> If you will pay all of my bills, <laughs> all we need is just the price of a cup of coffee. If you just give the price of a cup of coffee. Look at these you children. Can feed, you can feed me and my children. <laughs> They're starving. <laughs> anyway, this is actually, we're probably going to be doing more. Um, I'm going to try to do one with Doug and one with Jonathan. That's the goal. Uh, obviously, we all have work. We all have lives. Um, and I definitely... Be looking forward to the Parents' Guide to the Universe, which I want to do with Lexi, my sister Lexi. So we might be, once we get the studio up and running, which is something new you guys can be praying about. We, my brother is allowing us to use a, a section of the old youth room that's not being used to create a studio for us to do uh, podcasts, videos, and whatnot. So hopefully in the future, really this really close future, we'll be moving into that. So we'll actually be doing some videos. We'll actually be doing some more stuff. So... You guys can be praying for that. We might end up in the future. I'm hoping by the end of next year, maybe, to either be uh, to be on Patreon or one of those sites as well. I just really, once we start promoting this, we really just need more subscribers. Uh, as, as of right now, we've only got about 55. So the more people that subscribe, the more people that like our stuff, the more we're able to, more content we will be able to bring you because then we can in essence, quit our jobs and start doing this for a living. And we can become monetized by YouTube and we can find other avenues with which to do this. But for right now, just look for us wherever you can find your podcast. And hopefully the website will be up by, probably by the end of January, the website will be back up. So love y'all. God Same bless. Folks. Keep us in prayer. We'll keep you in prayer as always. Have a wonderful day.